Today I have Andy Allen, and then on uh, Starleaf we have Karen Mullen, the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, Robin Newton, and Sinead Ennis. So I'm going to go then straight to agenda item one, which is apologies. Do we have any apologies for today's meeting? No, no apologies. Okay, I'll move on then to agenda item two, which is draft minutes. You'll find the draft minutes for the meeting of the 20th of May, 2021, at page six of your meeting packs. And um, can I ask members, are you content to agree the minutes is drafted? Agreed. Great, thank you. I'll move on then to agenda item three, which is chairperson's business. And just to remind members that we're holding the third of uh, our informal stakeholder events that will take place next Tuesday between 1.30 and 3.30 um, in room 30. The theme is COVID recovery and invitations have been issued to groups who had requested to brief the committee on issues within this theme. Uh, St Vincent de Paul and the Development Trust NI have confirmed attendance. The, the Carnegie UK Trust are unable to attend and we are awaiting replies from Joseph Browntree Foundation and the Belfast Chamber. Um, I know we have a little bit of business, committee business in the chamber on Tuesday, um, but all being well, it should be completed by then. But um, certainly, if, if it isn't, we'll just run, be running slightly later. Um, so, members happy enough with that for Tuesday? Yes? Chair, sorry, could you repeat what time we're starting at on Tuesday? It's just there was a bit of feedback. Certainly, Kelly. We're starting at 1.30. Thank you. One, we have booked the room from 1.30 to 3.30. Okay, room thirty. Th room thirty. That will be okay. Then, members. Um, then I want to draw your attention to an event that co-ownership is running next Friday morning, the fourth of June at ten thirty. All email. All MLAs have been em emailed an invitation, and co-ownership hope that by attending this session, MLAs and their constituency often staff will know more about co-ownership and be able to suggest products to help people um, who have housing needs. So that came in, I think we, we received that yesterday. Um, I just felt I wanted to, do, to mention it today instead of leaving it until next Thursday. It might be a bit late for people to um, get into their diaries. So it's just to make members aware of that. And then also it has been brought to my attention that no confirmation has yet been given to Advice NI in relation to their contracts. Another temporary extension has been given up until the 30th of June. And this is very unsettling for staff and welfare issues, as we know, are likely to increase, especially when as, as furlough comes to an end. So uh, it's just a members in agreement. Can we then just forward a letter through to the, to the minister and the department to ask um, to, just for a little bit more clarification around this? I know there was money um, allocated within the budget, um, but I think the, the, the advice sector in general um, to, to only have an extension up until the 30th of June is not really good enough. Um, so it is for, for the staff, it's very unsettling for them. So members agreement with that? Yes, Chair, can I also ask that we actually ask Advice NI what the impact of this is? Because I know um, when I worked in the community voluntary sector and others are like me, um, Whenever you haven't got a contract, and given the fact that June is next week, um, you have to go into redundancy mode um, and let staff know that there's a threat of redundancy. That's good um, housekeeping within a company and within an organisation. I'm just wondering, has Advice NI had to take that step, or has there been an informal or, you know, confirmation from the department for them? Because otherwise, we're going to lose amazing, experienced staff from positions that we need. I've also worked in the voluntary and community sector and know what it's like um, to become indeed the, the end of a funding contract even or where funding hasn't been extended and staff will naturally look for other jobs uh, and that leaves gaping holes within services. Um, I also know that from, from sitting on the health committee for many years and many of those contracts that were, were you know, run right close to the wire. Um, so I think that is a good uh, a good point to ask advice and I. Um, are they saying any different, uh, you know, are they saying staff um, leaving because of the uncertainty uh, and, and other issues. So, yeah, we can certainly do that as well. Um, are members content then that we move on then to our next agenda item after that? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Okay, members, I'm going to move then to matters arising. Can I inform members you've been provided at page 14 with a response from the Department for Infrastructure in relation to funding for the voluntary and community sector? A detailed breakdown of funding to all relevant organisations has been provided in Annex A. 
uh, in overview, DFI provided funding to community places to provide independent planning advice and engagement services for people and communities. Uh, then to 12 organisations through Road Safety Grant Scheme, and DFI also manages the PHI DFI jointly funded active school travel programme. Then to the Lagan Valley Regional Park Limited, and uh, also to a range of voluntary and charitable organisations through the Rural Transport Fund and Transport Programme for people with disabilities. Can I then ask on that item, are members content to note, or do they have any comments? Kelly? Chair, I need to declare an interest as the former director for the Ireland of the Community Transport Association. I know it's been a while ago, but I always like to declare that interest. Okay, thank you for that, Kelly. Are members content to note that um, response from the Department for Infrastructure? Yeah, and Chair, I suppose just to note that it is a very thorough response uh, in comparison to the, the couple that we got last week and even what we've received from our own department, yeah. I have to say, thus far. No, it is. Uh, it gives that breakdown that I think it was it was either yourself or Kelly brought that up last week that we need a more detailed breakdown. So it is a, a fair response. You're quite right. Chair, uh, there's one matter arising from this, and the reason why we were asking for it is a bit like um, we will be asking, I'm sure, the department ourselves um, over a number of periods of time. Um, this is all one year budget. Um, so planning ahead, um, when we're looking at the, the strategy for disability, the social strategy that's coming up, um, when we look at the investment that's provided through infrastructure on the transport programme for people with disabilities, there's no forward planning, there's no you know, multi-year uh, opportunities there to create efficiencies. This is something that's going across all departments. So the, one of the reasons we were asking for a breakdown from um, infrastructure and it just going to show this is this is cross departmental is the the single year budgets don't give any certainty going forward um, and i know that infrastructure will be committed to providing um, repeat funding of this nature to those groups but it's actually not a cost efficient way of funding organisations. Um, like, for instance, there's a pilot project to enable RCTPs, I know, stands for the Rural Community Transport Partnerships and DA Disability Action to buy electric minibuses. That's wonderful. But you buy an electric minibus and then you don't get any um, reserve, you know, or sorry, um, resource money to actually pay to run the things. Um, and there's very little electric vehicle infrastructure out there for charge points. So. There's a lot of cross-departmental working, and I'm hoping maybe we could write a letter to um, the folk within the department who are working on the disability strategy to ask them how they and will they be including um, a section on how money is spent across departments to ensure that outcomes can be delivered for people with disabilities on a long-term basis. I'm happy enough with that proposal. Members agree with that? Yeah? Yeah, I don't see anybody not agree. So now we can take that proposal forward. Is there any other comments members wish to make on, on page 14? No, we're happy I move on then to the next item. All right. I'll move then on to page 19, where you'll find a ministerial response in relation to the flexibility of council meetings. Um, the unspent balance of £35.8 million from funding allocated to councils during 2020-21 to alleviate projected financial losses can I be used to enable councils to meet in person until the issue of remote meetings is resolved. Members, I know we discussed this last week at our meeting, um, so are members content uh, to note that correspondence or any comments? Kelly? Chair, can I just ask, um, I know that the Minister has, has told us that she's drafted legislation. It's still not on the agenda for next week. Um, and. Well, I suppose we'll find out a business committee um, on the 1st of June whether or not it will be on the, on the next week after that. But given the fact that this legislation won't take a p effect until um, royal assent is achieved, um, can we check with the department when they expect councils to be able to access remote working? Because by then we may well have a situation where COVID allows people to go and work from their offices again. Um, I'm just wondering how long that will, will be. Will it be September, October? Can we get a date or a potential get date from the department when they think that this um, will go forward? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I think we do need to know. And I think that actually not that we need to know. Councils need to know. They need to know for their planning as well. And I, I know I was talking about it last week. We've got council AGMs coming up in June where they're having to book, uh, you know, hotels, theatres, wherever, um, to hold their AGMs. Um, but that'll be also for their meetings as well. 
Um, so the, and albeit I know over that summer recess period, um, there may be not quite as many meetings take place. Um, but I, I do think in order for them to plan, that, that would be that it would be good if they did have a, a, a clear timetable um, of when they expect this legis legislation to, be, to be, uh, come into effect. So I'm happy enough with that proposal also. Any other members want to make comment or happy to do with that proposal and we move on? Okay, moving on then. Um, can I ask you to turn to page 20? where you'll see a response from DWP in relation to special rules for terminal illness. I can hear somebody speaking in the background, if members could put themselves on silent. Thank you, Chief Ra. There we are. Um, Janice, my screen's gone off. Okay. <laughs> so I can't see anybody at all anymore. Um, can I just then inform members, uh, uh, as I said, page 20, response from DWP in relation to special rules for terminal illness. Um, DWP states that it is committed um, to delivering an improved benefit system for claimants that are nearing the end of their lives and is working across government to bring forward proposals following the evaluation. DWP remains committed to implementing the key areas identified in the evaluation and a consensus to change the six-month rule, improving um, consistency with other services used by people nearing the end of life and raising awareness of support um, that is available. The outcome of the evaluation will be announced in due course. Um, again, members, any comments on this or content and note at this stage? Okay, I can't see members anymore, so you need to speak if you've got. Uh, if you don't speak, I know you're content. So that's I, think yeah. I think I have to say we're content with this um, response, but it's very disappointing. Yeah, uh, Chair, uh, same. Just I suppose maybe I know they're saying there, but maybe asking for further clarity when we make really make a decision. Yeah, I mean it. It, it, it is. It's the best possible outcome that DWP bring this forward. Um, and you know that we would hope that this is done sooner rather than later, and uh, you know fully support that. So if there's anything further that we can do um, to advance that and support that, then I'm happy enough. If members want to do any of that, any other comments? No. Okay. Look, I'm going to move on then to page 21, where you'll see a departmental response in relation to the shared prosperity. Uh, UK Shared Prosperity Fund. The Community Renewal Fund is a one-year pilot scheme in preparation for the UK Shared Prosperity Fund. An initial allocation of 11 million has been earmarked for Northern Ireland. This fund will be administered directly by the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government. The Finance Minister leads on future funding and has discussed both the Shared Prosperity Fund and the Community Renewal Fund extensively with the Executive uh, Ministers from the Cabinet Office, Treasury, NIO departments for transport and with ministers from other devolved areas. Um, members, uh, again, this was discussed last week and was discussed during um, question time last week as well with the minister. Um, anybody want to comment further on this? Are they content to note at this stage? Content? Yeah. Okay. Just members, I can't see you at the moment, so if you can just um, say that you're content, I'd appreciate that. I can't see your heads moving or anything else. I'm going to then move on to page 22, which is a departmental response in relation to the historic status of the Boyne Bridge. Um, the department can confirm that the present built bridge was built in 1935-36 and is not afforded statutory designation by listing, as it has been determined not to meet the statutory tests for listing. It is built on a site of a number of earlier bridges, and at this time there is insufficient information on the condition and extent of buried remains of the 17th century bridge to consider designation of these concealed elements as a scheduled historic monument. However, the department is pursuing the strategy of preservation of the earliest bridge remains with DFI strategic planning and with the development of Transport Hub and their archaeological consultants. Um, members, I know some of us will have received um, emails around this as well. Just asking at this stage, um, members, any comment or content to note at the moment? <clears throat> content? I think, Chair, sorry, I was just going to say, Kelly here, um, I know that the, the group have asked to meet us, and I think this is uh, the reason why I'd asked for this is, 
at least this is information that we have in advance of that meeting um, because I know the group are keen to protect the existing bridge. Um, it does look as if it doesn't fall within the historical um, requirements, you know, to be protected, unfortunately, but um, I'd be interested um, maybe before we have the meeting with, with the group um, to find out if there has been any further movement on that archaeological um, survey that's being done of the earlier bridge from the 1600s. So I appreciate there's some um, that's coming through later on that. Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Fran. Sure. And, uh, I don't live that far from uh, the bridge. And uh, like everybody else, if, if, if there is something there that uh, is of uh, significant, uh, that, that, that is of significance, and, uh, and I've been dealing with the the the, uh, the, the, the transport hub in this. My understanding is that there's been extensive cons consultations done over the past number of years, which continues and it takes in uh, the, 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 the bridge. Uh, but the transport hub is, and I, I agree totally that what we need to do is protect and save uh, uh, anything of historical significance. Uh, but the, uh, we also, and I said the last time, what we need to do is the likes of Sandy Road Forum and uh, groups like that. And there's some MLAs from the area. Uh, also, we need to take in their considerations and ask them and, uh, what, 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 what they believe. Because this campaign has been going on forever and a day. And uh, the, there is a multi, multi million pound uh, scheme that is planned. And uh, initially, uh, the, 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 when they, I think it was the Saltwater Bridge uh, that, 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 that they were talking about, that, that King William crossed uh, uh, many, uh, obviously a few hundred years ago. Now it's worth protecting. Uh, and I, but uh, my understanding is that it, that uh, bridge itself uh, has been encased in concrete during the building of the 1936 bridge, uh, which is a, a bit a bit off. So I think there's a we, rather than yes, listen to the group, but listen to the wider thing. There was an ex an extensive consultation uh, where local opinion was taken on board, and uh, the crucial element of what the transport hub in general uh, means in terms of employment and infrastructure and, and in, in the general area. So there are two trains of thought of it locally, from what I understand, and uh, we should tap into that also. Okay, look, yeah. thank you for that, Fra. I mean, we can, if members, uh, if it's members will, we can certainly um, ask for, for further information or briefing on this. There's not a problem from, from all interested parties. Um, oh, could, that. could that include information from the, the transport hub? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it has to be all interested yeah. parties. It can't just yeah. be one or other. Kelly? Chair, I was just going to ask, can I, I know this is maybe a bit of work for somebody, but can I get clarification um, what the committee's role is on this? I know that the group are, are trying to save a process and I'm very, as Fra has said, there's there's millions of pounds going into the, the transport hub, um, which is very exciting for the area. Um, whenever I was in an infrastructure, I was involved in some of those conversations. Um, but I'm just wondering from this committee's point of view, what is our role? What can we do with this? I'm, I'm just unsure if the group comes to speak to us, what we can do for them or can't do for them, um, if we can maybe get clarification on that. Yeah, I would assume our role is because of the, the historic nature falls under our, our committee. Um, the, and, and that is important, that's extremely important. Um, so, uh, uh, but the actual um, the, the transport hub would not fall under our, the transport side wouldn't fall under our committee, but certainly the historic side does. Um, so that's why we would be listening from that angle. So we would. Okay, members. Are members happy enough that we move on from that? Yeah. yeah. All right, members, can I then ask you to turn to page 24, where you'll see a departmental response in relation to the Job Start Scheme. Um, the response provides confirmation of engagement between officials from the department and colleagues in the Department of the Economy throughout the development of the scheme. This has included the Career Service. Uh, agreement was reached with careers, advise, careers advisors would, as part of their delivery advice and guidance, consider if the job start scheme was an appropriate option on a case-by-case -case basis. 
where a careers advisor and a young person determines that the job start, job start scheme is an appropriate option that will then be signposted to a work coach if they receive a working age benefit or directly to the job start scheme, scheme administered it's really hard to say this job start scheme administration <coughs> team if they don't work co co coaches are an integral part of the job start scheme they are crucial to the excess of the scheme and have been involved in the designing of the scheme and preparing for the launch uh, work coaches will provide and work support to young people who take up job start jobs and get with the young person at the end of month five to have a discussion about next steps and whether they need to need support to find another job after the job start opportunity has completed. Um, members of the and I think this, this was responses to some questions we had asked. Have you any comments on that? Are you content with those responses? Chair, can I just raise a yep. couple of minutes on it? Go ahead, Robin. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, thank you, Chair. And uh, I, I think <clears throat> I, I am a bit concerned uh, with the job start scheme, um, and it looks to me as if we might be moving back to schemes that didn't have a great reputation, YTP and YOP and things of that nature. And I think the essential one that uh, is missing for me is the ability of the young person to actually gain a qualification, a vocational qualification. And I do think there is a danger, and I know that the department have huge uh, levels of experience. But if there is no qualification for the young person at the end of the program, and they aren't offered a job by the employer, which I anticipate may be significant for a number of them, that indeed they leave the scheme and they move on to something else without having gained any recognized skills. Now, if that can be addressed, then I would be certainly much more comfortable with the scheme. But I think, Chair, we have asked, the committee has asked, the, the question around qualifications on a number of occasions now, and we haven't actually had an answer, specific answer, to the question. No, you're, you're absolutely right, Robin, and some of us are old enough to remember those various schemes through the years. Um, so uh, we know we have asked that and haven't received that response. But just to, I just want to mention, before we continue any further on the subject, we are getting a briefing um, from the Department on the 24th of June um, on labour market interventions. So that will be certainly one of the questions. If we haven't received a response by then, certainly um, it will be a question as to why we haven't and what are they doing. And if we don't receive a satisfactory response, that can be questioned further. Robin, I know it's something you've brought up several times during this, and I think you're absolutely right to bring it up. Um, Kelly, did you want to come in as well? I'm just just going to follow up from what Robin was saying. Um, some of the details that we have asked for haven't been provided. I know that we've asked on several occasions, you know, for what, um, or sorry, where across Northern Ireland the jobs are based. We keep on being said that, you know, they're engaging with employers. I don't know one single solitary employer in my area that has been engaged with or has engaged with the process. Um, so I, we need that breakdown for that meeting on the 24th of June. We need some background information to be able to have appropriate scrutiny of this job start role. Um, the other thing that we need clarification on is we have a huge number of people who are coming out of school very soon. Um, and how long do they have to wait being unemployed before they can actually go on to this scheme. Um, this is supposed to stop people from being unemployed, but it does seem to be that unless you're already on benefits and, and you know, have been, then you can't get access to this scheme. Um, so why have they opened it for 16 year olds if a 16 year old is going to have to be in work for whatever length of time um, before they can get access? And like Robert says, unless this comes with qualifications, all of those young people's training and, and the, the experience that they get is for nothing because employers look for qualifications. 
um, as well as Experian. And if we're not giving those young people the opportunity to have those types of qualifications, then where are we taking these young people? Is this just churning out people, keeping them busy for a while, and then in a year's time, they're back out um, on, on the unemployment lists again? Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, uh, Sean just wants to come in here on a few points, so just bear with us. Yeah, we, we just looked it up. We did send a letter to the department again on the 13th of May in relation to qualifications and the geographical split. So we're still waiting on a response on those points, but I, I don't know if members want to write again or want to wait until the briefing on the 24th. I, if you heard that, members, the, the letter was sent on the 13th of May on both of those subjects, on the on the on the qualifications and the, the geographical split, and we haven't received a response. Sure. We, we can write to them again, or um, what we can do is notify the department that when they come in on the 24th, we want those answers. Um, we would like that information. Um, did who else wanted to come in there? Did somebody else want to speak? Fra. Fra, go ahead, Fra. Yeah. Sure, and I had spoken this uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, the, the last time it was uh, up in front of the committee, and I, I agree with Robin is that we need to be uh, obviously uh, give a close observation uh, to monitor it. Uh, there needs to be continuous reviews uh, and and its worthiness. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, that the, the difference between this and I don't know all the ins and outs of it is that it's locally. Uh, developed the, the, some of the last schemes that I was on the Dell committee that argued against some of the schemes that came in uh, that uh, they, they, the, the contracts or the tenders were won by uh, major multinational companies that uh, that uh, took 27% administration off and left very little and I mean, also the quality of the schemes in the past uh, left a lot to be desired. I think what uh, I, I, I I've also argued that there, there needed to be uh, not only qualification, but a year doesn't get you the qualification that you retire and uh, that you require. As a matter of fact, in terms of apprenticeships, uh, we, that, that Dale had run like, two-year apprenticeships were weren't recognised by the governing bodies. So there's a whole lot of things in there that we need to look at, uh, that, that we need to deal with and, uh, that, and get the answers to it. And it's about the worthiness of the scheme and where young people go after it. And I think that's a crucial element. But I think uh, if, it's, you know, if it's locally grown, if it's been uh, run by the department, then we, we would, would have an, an, in, an input or a say in the direction that that is taken. And I think that's a crucial element. Because we have all an interest in it. Was one of the things that they brought in uh, was uh, the, the senior apprentices which excluded many people that Robin's talking about. So all that needs to be taken on, uh, on board uh, when, when, when we're looking at it. Maybe we'll get the answers in, 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 in June. And it's something that we really need to keep our eye on uh, in, in the future. No, I agree. And I mean, even if, it, even if it's looking at, at yeah. this being a gateway to an apprenticeship, um, that um, I think would be would be wonderful as well because so many of our young people can't get on even onto the apprenticeship ladder because they don't have the necessary um, qualifications to do that and and you know I, I'd love this to be some some sort of gateway um, to enable that Robin I I can only see half of you Robin so I think you're waving at me so go ahead. No, Chair, I'm, I'm content to, if, uh, with Sean's point there that we only wrote last week uh, on the matter. And I, I'm content to wait until we get the briefing from the department. That's great. Okay, members. Are members happy that we, we move on from that subject? Yes? Yeah? Okay. All right, then. I'm going to then ask you to turn to page 26, where you'll see a departmental response in relation to gender budgeting in sport. Um, it states that at present there are no plans to adopt gender budget, ju budgeting specifically and the department will continue with its current approach which is, which is through the use of the equality screening process. Gender budgeting uh, by the NI executive was raised in the report by the expert panel on the gender <coughs> equality strategy. It is therefore under consideration by the gender equality co-design and cross departmental groups for inclusion in the strategy which is due to be published pending executive appro approval by December 2021. It's 
Sport NI has advised that it believes that given the diversity of the scale and size of governing bodies of sport, gender budget budgeting per se may not be an effective tool at this stage of development, but it will keep it under review. Um, members, can I ask, uh, before I say anything on is there any comments members want to make on this? No, yeah, go ahead, Alex, is that your hand up? No, it wasn't Alex. Uh, hold on, I can only see part of the bottom screen. Is that Kelly? No. Sorry, Kelly, yes. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask if we could possibly forward a copy of this to um, the Women's Caucus. We did have a debate within the Assembly on International Women's Day um, and we will be having more debates coming through from the caucus about gender budgeting. I'm a bit disappointed that it's not being considered at the moment given the fact that we have a report later about female participation in sport. Um, gender budgeting isn't, of course, just about women. Um, it's about ensuring equality in budgeting. Um, it's a way of proactively um, using your budget to create equity as opposed to just making sure that women are there. Um, so it's a bit disappointing that that's not in place. Um, I appreciate that the department is saying that it may not be appropriate at this stage, but it would be worthwhile to ask the department what are they doing, um, given the fact that they have the gender strategy um, to ensure that um, those sporting bodies all understand exactly what gender budgeting is and um, how they're capacity building to ensure that those organisations, whenever we require gender budgeting to be considered, will be able to take that forward? No, I absolutely agree with you as well. And can I also just suggest that we send this uh, response also on to the All Party Group on Women, Peace and Security, 1325. Um, I, I, it's the one that I chair. I chaired it yesterday and we did discuss issues in general across departmental and gender budgeting and the, the gender, um, certainly the, um, the gender strategy. Um, came up and issues. Um, I mean, we, we received responses to the APG um, around specific gender issues and are, are being told constantly because of Section 75 um, that, that that one gender cannot be prioritised over another. Um, and you know, it, it's just not good enough that when it, when you look at violence against women and girls, or you look at gender budgeting, or or the, or the gender strategy. Um, these things need to be fit for purpose. Um, so I think that there, there's a lot of work to be done on the, on all, all on all issues uh, around gender. Um, so I, if members are agreed, can we ask for that as well to be sent forward to them for for their further consideration? Um, any agreed. other comments on this, members? Are happy to move on? Move on. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll then ask you to turn to page 28, which is departmental response in relation to the Court of Appeal judgment and charities judgments. Uh, members, you will recall that we requested details of increased cost as a result of the committee um, that the Commission has had to establish following the Court of Appeal judgment and responses to concerns raised with the Department in 2011 about the delegation of functions to staff following the McBride Junction. Judgment, the Commission established a Schedule 1 decision making committee in accordance with the Charities Act Northern Ireland 2008. The total cost of the decision making committee to the end of March 2021 was £128,000. The question as to whether an express power of delegation was necessary within the Act were first raised with the Department for Social Development um, by Charity Commission staff in June 20, 2011. Um, when discussions were being made on the content of the bill, which would lead to the Charities Act in 2013. On other information, the Commission has now confirmed that all red flags were posted to the register prior to McBride have been removed. Charities which continue to submit voluntarily will not be red flagged if they miss their due date as there is no statutory requirement for them to submit these, and charities which have been lawfully registered by the Schedule 1 committee set up after the McBride judgment are not due to submit their returns until later this year. Um, there is an intention to red flag any of those charities which miss statutory uh, filing deadlines to show them as being in default. The Commission has confirmed it will write to relevant funders in respect of the new levelling up related funding programmes 
being managed centrally by the UK government um, to ensure that no charity is disadvantaged. The committee asked about organisations being taken to court by the Commission and whether there was consideration within the proposed legislation on who can hold Commission to account. Um, officials advised there, there was an explicit line in the terms of reference um, for the Minister's independent review of charity regulation, which seeks to examine if there was something proportionate which could be implemented short of going to tribunal. Um, members, again, I'm going to ask if any comments are content to note. Andy, can you go ahead. For first instance, can I declare an interest as a charity trustee? And just on page 31, I think it is, um, the synopsis that uh, has been provided is quite useful, but can we go further to that, Chair, if possible, if members are in agreement, and ask for copies of the correspondence relating to this, including the legal advice, if that's not uh, privileged? Yes, certainly agree with that proposal. Any other members want to raise an issue? Are we agreed with Andy's proposal? Yeah. Agreed. Okay, that's grand. Thank you, members. I'm going to move on then to page 32, where you'll see a departmental response in relation to the closure of post office card accounts. It states that as the majority of banks' uh, personal customers are now able to withdraw or deposit cash and checks and make balance inquiries at any post office counter, this should be beneficial for customers in rural areas who will not be physically required to visit a bank branch to access their accounts. Customers who have difficulty getting to a bank or withdrawing money at an ATM can nominate a trusted friend or family member to do so on their behalf. In addition, customers without access to a bank account can opt for it to be paid into the account of a family member or close friend if permission from the account holder has been given and an agreement has been made on how the money deposited will be used. Any, adjust, any ju adjustments that need to be made to the amount a customer receives or recover of any overpayment of benefit or pension will be done at the benefit paying office before monies reach the nominated account. In respect of the level of identification required to open a mainstream account, they say all banks and building societies will ask for proof of identity and address, uh, but different forms of ID are accepted by different banks. A customer should talk to the bank uh, of their choice to establish exactly what evidence the bank is willing to accept. Um, for customers that are unable to satisfy the requirements to open up standard account, there are options of fee-free, more basic bank accounts. Customers who cannot access or manage a bank building society or credit union account will automatically be moved to a new single payment exception service to guarantee payment continuity. The proposal is for a payment in and cash out voucher service using the Paypoint networked cash vouchers and potent potential encashment through additional outloads outlets is being explored, explored. Customers will also be able to cash one voucher at a time if they are concerned about carrying large amounts of cash and the department will be engaging with all relevant stakeholders to discuss this marketing strategy including the Commissioner for Older People, Age NI, Age Sector Partnership and Advice NI. Uh, I know that was some of the questions that we'd, we'd asked the last time we discussed this. So I'm going to ask again, any comments members want to make on, on that response? Kelly? Can I just seek clarification? When I was reading through this, I was quite surprised when um, credit unions were mentioned. Um, and I know that people in rural areas do use credit unions and, and absolutely love them. Um, but does this mean then that the person in an account in a credit union, just can we get clarification on that, that a benefit can be paid into a credit union then for that for people? Because that would be the other alternative. Um, the letter misses the whole point in the fact that, for instance, in my agency, um, people will have to travel at a minimum of 30 miles to get to a bank, to even open a bank account. Um, if you're non-verbal and you don't have any bills in your own name, you can't open an account, no matter what they're saying. And this has come up time and time again, not just for people with um, a lot of dis or disabilities or who are older people, 85, who no longer have a driving license or don't have, don't, haven't kept their driving license or don't have a passport. Um, the ID issue is, is a difficult one. Um, I'm still not clear. Um, I know that they've said in the letter that if there's an issue with the government and there has been a mistake, that that will be taken out at the benefit side of things as opposed to from the bank account that, that has been nominated to receive a benefit. It doesn't say clearly enough for me 
that that bank account cannot be, you know, will it be accessed by government? Um, because at the moment, anyone who receives a benefit, to be honest, their bank account can be looked into by government. So yeah. if friends or family can um, provide a bank account for a person who can't get a bank account open themselves, um, is their bank account then able, you know, are they then agreeing for others to, to look into that? Um, so there are a few anomalies. It would be useful if at some stage in the future when we have time that we have representatives from the department come forward to discuss these issues with us because we'll just go back and forward and back and forward in paperwork and we need clarification. I think you've just read our minds there, Kelly. Uh, the clerk just passed me a note to say, right, OK, enough is enough here of this back and forward. We need to get a briefing on this. So I think that is something we do need to do. And I mean, even for the credit unions, and I know myself because I, I, I opened one not that long ago, I had to take down um, photographic ID to open up a credit union account as well. And, you know, utility bill and all those other things. So, I mean, it, it, it's equally... Um, uh, uh, as, as difficult as any bank to open an account in, as, as it should be for ver for many, many reasons, as we know. Um, so, yeah, that issue around credit unions and paying benefits into credit unions would be good to know. Um, so, look, let's do that. Let's rather not... This has just gone on, the bouncing back and forward. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's coming up in my matters arising nearly every other week, so I think we need to uh, get them in and get them to answer the, the, the questions then that members have. Are members happy enough with that action on that? Yeah? Happy yeah. with the action. Good stuff. All right, I'm going to move on then to page 35 where you'll see um, a proposed draft response on the budget 21-22. Um, members, the debate on Tuesday was un unexpected and as such I had to make my speech based on this draft report before the committee. Um, could consider it at today's meeting. Um, members, if you have any comments, are you content with this response and that we issue it then through to the Committee for Finance? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Andy, do you want to come? Sure, yeah, I'm content with the report. Just, just further to that, um, and I'm mindful, again, to use your previous comments, enough is enough, um, and this is a regular occurrence on our matters arising, is the welfare reform mitigations and the closing of the loopholes. And it's just if we can write the department and get a better understanding of where this is, because you know, we've had various pieces of legislation, and today we're going to get a briefing on gambling, very, very important. But the welfare uh, reform regulations and the closing of the loopholes it just seems to have disappeared. Um, the department's been working on this for some time now, uh, and I just cannot understand why the legislation has not been introduced to the Assembly as yet. Okay. No, I uh, yeah, I think that is uh, it's something that we need to um, certainly bring it in. The, the uh, clerk wanted Sean, to I come in there. John, Sean, do you want to? to I was just suggesting that we actually ask them to come in and brief yeah. on this issue as well, then, yeah. rather than the back and forward, get them in and ask the yeah, questions. Yeah, let, let's just do that. Get them in, get the department in, and, and let them brief us. Um, I, our, we went into closed session last week for our forward work program, so we're <laughs> completely throwing it out the window again this week. But there, there you are. That's the way it goes. Um, so yeah, that's another one. That that we need to get in sooner rather than later. I'd like that before summer recess as well um, to get a handle on that. Members agreed? Agreed. Good stuff. All right, members, we're going to then, that's me finished, I think, is it? It is, that's the matters arising fin finished. We're going to then move on to agenda item five, which is a departmental briefing on the reform of gambling law. Um, members, you'll find this paper for this agenda item is at page 42 of your meeting pack. Then can I then welcome Liam Quinn, Martina Campbell and Kieran Me. Um, let me just see, we'll just wait until we bring you all in. There we go. There we are. These are all now in the spotlight. You're very, very welcome. Good to have you here. Um, Liam, it's good to have you back. Never mind here. <laughs> good morning, Chair. I, I sort of feel like I should really give apologies for not attending the last two meetings. But... <laughs> no, strange not having you with us. Um, no, that's fine. Look, Liam, if you want to go ahead, is it yourself that's going uh, to present? Yes, yes, Chair. Excuse, me. Excuse me, Chair. Yeah. Uh, I'm just checking. Can I be heard? Kieran, me here? Kieran, we can hear you. Your screen is that's like a, your screen's like a snowstorm. Um, but yeah, we'll that's, that's, that, I can see you, but uh, uh, unfortunately you can't see me for some reason. They're just checking. Thank you. No bother, Kieran. Thank you. Okay, Liam, go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah Chair, um, I, I give some background to uh, how we got to where we are now um, and to discuss how the Minister proposes to proceed uh, around the reform of gambling. And then uh, my colleagues uh, Martina and Cairn uh, will go through, through the detailed proposals and, and we'll take any questions if, if that's okay. So um, the background of this goes back a number of years, but more recently in, in 2019, when we didn't have uh, ministers in place, um, our permanent secretary in the department uh, decided to issue a, an open-ended consultation around gambling, uh, because we would come under uh, pressure from a number of stakeholders and interested parties around reforming the legislation. Um, the legislation dates back to, to 1985, um, and it's actually based on much older English legislation, the, the 1963 Act. So it's very out of date and hasn't kept place with uh, developments in the whole uh, field of gambling over the last uh, 35 years. And so a consultation was carried out. We got a lot of responses and it was very clear from the responses to the consultation that reform of legislation was urgently required. Um, and quite a substantial reform. Uh, it wasn't something that could be done uh, very e easily or quickly. Um, so the Minister considered her options and looking at the scale of the reform, uh, it was clear that given this was a very short mandate, which now is due to expire probably in March uh, 22, uh, it would not be possible to undertake the full reform that is required. Just to give members uh, an idea of what we believe would be need, needed to be done to reform the, the gambling legislation properly, um, the Act on GB, which came in in 2005 and is ready up for review, it has 360 articles. So for us to bring forward a bill which will have 360 clauses uh, and try and get it through between now and next March is it, clearly not possible. Uh, members will have had experience of dealing recently with the licensing bill, which had 36 clauses. Um, this bill would be 10 times that size um, and would need a huge resource from the department to, to try and uh, deliver it within the, in the time scale and from the committee. So the minister concluded that that clearly wasn't uh, feasible um, and has decided rather than doing nothing, uh, she feels that it's important to try and do something. So what we're bringing forward here now is uh, a smaller bill which will try and tackle some of the uh, issues that have been raised during the consultation and which can be done by way of an amendment to the existing order rather than a full rewrite. Uh, essentially what we're talking about is a two-phased approach. Uh, we will take forward uh, in this mandate uh, some of the issues that can be achieved and can be delivered before the end of the mandate and then it will be for the new minister in uh, the new assembly after the election to decide how to proceed. But the expectation would be that officials will, will put to the minister options for a phase two, which would be a much uh, fuller reform of gambling legislation. Uh, I mean, and the, the executive have signed up to this approach and have now agreed that we will draft a bill which we will uh, hopefully the minister will introduce to the assembly before the summer recess which would allow the committee stage to start um, before uh, the summer and uh, give us time to complete the uh, legislative passage by uh, the uh, end of the mandate. So, uh, Chair, that's the background. I'll now ask uh, Martina uh, to take us through some of the proposals that the Minister's bringing forward. Go ahead, Martina. I can't sit, I've lost my screen again. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. That's a Antoinette brought me out a couple of times today here. Is there? We had to hear her just. I've lost my screen, so I'm relying on you. She's there. There you go. I have to bring up the participants again. Oh, do you? Okay. No, I do that. There you oh, go. you do? Okay. Sorry, Martina, can you hear me? Everybody's frozen on my screen. Her, um, she's muted at her end. Okay, Martina, can you look at your end and see if you're muted for us? It's telling us that you're muted at your end. It's not ours. I just love technology on a Thursday mm. morning. <laughs> so do I. Um, oh. Okay, my connection's failed again. 
I'll go. Chair, if it's helpful, I'll maybe take you through uh, yeah. some of these uh, proposals. Um, I need to get a pair of glasses so I can read. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, some of the proposals that the minister is going to bring forward, uh, they're going to create new offences in relation to operators inviting, causing or permitting a person under 18 to play high stakes uh, gaming machines. Uh, prohibit the placing of any bet until identification on, uh, has been verified. Uh, make gambling contracts uh, legally enforceable by courts in, in Northern Ireland. Currently, um, a bet is, is not an enforceable contract. It's considered to be a gentleman's agreement. Uh, make, it'll make uh, gambling contracts legally enforceable, as I said that bit. Uh, make the possession of, of uh, an amusement or, uh, permit a mandatory <coughs> requirement for the operation of low stakes gaming machines in shopping centres and, and other premises. Introduce a new definition of cheating, which includes attempts to cheat, whether they are successful or not. Um, on top of this, uh, there are a number of anomalies which need to be addressed uh, within the, the uh, existing order. So the, the Minister plans to remove the current Sunday and Good Friday, uh, Good Friday prohibition on uh, bookmaker shops uh, and commercial bingo clubs. Uh, it's going to make it easier for residents here to participate in certain uh, promotional prize draws. Um, and uh, we're going to relax some of the rules around uh, commercial bingo club uh, membership. There will also be uh, a sort of a technical uh, amendment to remove the current uh, residency and incorporation requirements around the, gambling, the, the granting of licences and the lower age uh, limit uh, will be reduced to 18 rather than the current 21. So uh, that's uh, the proposals that Martina was going to speak to and if Kieran is available we'll ask him to take forward the, the rest of the uh, briefing. Right. Um, I take it everyone can hear me still? Yes, Karen McCann. Yeah, OK. Right. I, I'm conscious of committee's time, so I'll take you quickly through two other aspects of the Minister's proposals before handing you back to Liam to conclude. Um, first of all, um, one of the issues that's arisen a lot in the context of discussions about gambling revel regulation is the level of financial support that the industry provides towards addressing problem gambling. And there seems to be a, a considerable support emerging out of the consultation last year uh, in favour of uh, setting a levy on the industry. What's less clear is the level of the levy that people believe it should be set at and how it might operate. So taking those factors into account, the Minister has also decided as part of the coming bill to seek a power from, for this department to impose a financial levy on holders of betting, bookmaking, bingo club, gaming machine, and amusement licenses, certificates, and permits. And this would be a power which would be exercised by regulation, in other words, through subordinate legislation. And our intention would be, if possible, to use the proceeds from the levy to assist to fund research, education, and treatment of problem gambling here. Uh, second to this, the minister wants to give the department the power, in a power to introduce uh, a, a mandatory code of practice um, for the um, uh, gambling industry with the practice uh, just lost my notes it could cover various aspects of day-to-day -day gambling activity including the way licensed and other facilities are prov provided the arrangements to be followed how they're advertised consequences of failure to comply with the code um, and the minister, basically, we see the provisions, the, the levy power and the mandatory code of practice as both necessary and highly beneficial in terms of government, enabling government to respond with greater speed and agility, both now and in the future, to changes in industry structures and practice. Um, I'll hand back to Liam then. Just. Chair, um, just to, to conclude the, the briefing then, um, this is clearly just a, a high level um, uh, briefing for the, the committee, setting out how the Minister intends to proceed. Uh, um, we'll bring a bill uh, back to the committee in due course uh, and to the executive and then into the assembly. And of course, the committee will have the opportunity to carry out their detailed scrutiny uh, at a future date. Like so happy to take any questions, Chair.
Grant, luckily, and thank you, and Karen and Martina. I don't know if you fear can if we can hear you yet or not, but uh, we'll maybe try that. No, we still can't hear you, Martina. Um, can I just then, before we start, just um, just to say that I am a member of the All Party Group on Gambling Related Harm. So I have sat through um, several briefing sessions on that, um, uh, as well. I know Martina attends it. Uh, it's nearly like every week at the minute, so it is. Martina's there and attends that on behalf of the department. Um, like, Liam, I know that we're, we're not here to scrutinise and drill too deeply into anything because we don't have the bill in front of us yet, and this is just really just to give us a, a general overview. So I'll just remind members that it is a general overview uh, and it's not uh, drilling down into those specifics. I welcome it um, coming forward. It's been talked about for such a long time um, that, that, that we would get to see this. Um, disappointed it's not an entire bill, but um, uh, relieved in another sense because I don't think we would have been doing anything else other than this bill had it been the entire bill in front of us now at this late stage. Um, so uh, and that, that that's perfectly acceptable. Um, I know from sitting in the um, that all party group that I mentioned earlier that the, the regulatory body was something that was extremely important because how can we have um, legislation brought forward or amendments to legislation brought forward without a regulatory body to regulate that and to oversee that. So that's just something maybe you just if you could touch on a little bit more on that. And then also I want to ask about the, the levy as well. Um, again, I've sat on that all-party all group when levies have been discussed, and um, I agree that any levy should be going to um, support those people um, who, uh, either who have addic addictions or to support that that message um, to get out there about how gambling can you know can can be harmful, um, like many things. Um, I, I was interested to, to learn that the the levy down in the Republic of Ireland appears to go in, in its entirety to the horse racing fraternity and greyhound fraternity, which is really rather strange. Someone advised me of that the other day. Um, so it just would be interesting whenever you do come back, um, when we talk about levies, to, to look at, at the rest of uh, the jurisdictions, just how they all manage those levies. Um, I know the levies at present that are there, um, uh, from all of those, those, those large um, corporations, um, we see very little of that in Northern Ireland. Uh, the vast majority of that stays over in, in mainland UK and does not come across here. Um, so I think that anything that we do to help with that that process of, of the levy um, would, would be good as well. And then, um, again, we would be grateful if we could have this for, with us before the end of, of um June, uh, just to enable the committee then to go out for the committee consultation um, over over summer over the summer period, and then in that way we can hit the ground running then when we come back um, after recess. So that's just those points I wanted to make. And again, I understand this is just our first glimpse at this. It's not for mm -hmm. drilling down and asking some of those more awkward questions. Yeah, sure. I, I, I'll take those now. Uh, just on the uh, the regulator. Uh, for example, um, the, the Minister has said publicly that he does believe that the, the way forward and, and regulating gambling here is, is through uh, an independent regulator. But the way our order is, is structured and drafted, uh, to, to build in a regulator, the regulator is key and central to all of the legislation, so it does require an entire rewrite. It does entire a completely new bill, uh, which would have the uh, regulator front and centre uh, as the key uh, organisation for regulating and controlling gambling. So, creating a, a power or a, creating a regulator now would, would be of no benefit because the, the, the legal structure isn't there to allow the regulator to act effectively. Um, our enforcement currently is carried out by the police. Uh, and, and that would continue after the, this phase one bill goes through. Um, but in phase two, um, any minister bringing forward a bill would need to restructure the, the legislation entirely to have the regulator right in the centre. Um, so that, that's why the regulator isn't here in this, in this draft proposal. Uh, around the, the, the levy, uh, the, the, the levy in the south is similar to the one in GB, but it's a very different levy. That's the horse racing levy, Chair where uh, bookmakers pay a levy which goes towards helping to support and sustain uh, horse racing. 
um, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't come into the, the gambling field for, for us here. What we're talking about is an entirely uh, different levy, uh, which, as you quite rightly say, would be used uh, to help deal with uh, problem gambling. Uh, and it's almost along the, the, the lines of polluter pays, in that if, if, if the gambling organisations are, are uh, contributing to this harm, then they could make a, should make a contribution towards treating uh, people who do have uh, problems with gambling, but also educating others about the potential harms for gambling and how to avoid it and how to um, uh, try to uh, avoid gambling to excess or, or gambling that's going to cause you, you other harms, such as mental health issues or financial problems. Um, so those are the two points you raised, Chair, and quite happy to take any other questions. Just, I, just, I, I've Sinead and then Alex waiting to ask a question. Just to remind members to, to use their uh, raise hand function um, to let me know if they want to ask a question. Just, on the, on the, just finally on the levy, and I know that uh, this is maybe crystal ball stuff, um, but have we any? Uh, has there been any preliminary figures on around just uh, the total amount um, that levy could provide per year to, to help with these services? Uh, maybe, you know, maybe, Chair, if I could uh, maybe tell you a little bit about how we envisage the levy would operate. Yep, as I say, we would we would see this as something that's set through secondary legislation once we've taken the power. And the benefit of that, would, as we see it, would be that it would allow us more flexibility, not only to, to really uh, um, uh, set the amount, uh, prescribe the structure, and if needs be, because it's secondary legislation, if we need to change the amount at any stage um, or change the structure, we can do that relatively quickly. Uh, one of the problems we have with the 1985 order is that it's inflexible. And therefore, even if you were to try to make small amendments, that often requires you to go through changing the primary legislation itself, which is obviously very time consuming. So we, we see this as, as something that we will consider at, at secondary legislation stage and uh, obviously consult that way. Thank you, Karen. That's, that certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah. it does, yeah. No, look, thank you. I have I've nothing further at this stage. I really do look forward to getting that bill in our hands and, and, and starting proper scrutiny. Um, I'm then going to go to members. As I said, I have Sinead and Alex and then Fra. So Sinead first. Thank you, Sir. Um, and thanks to the, to the officials for bringing this um, in front of us today. Um, I suppose I, this is, I have a bit of a vested interest in this because... Um, I was responsible on behalf of Sinn Féin for putting together our party's gambling uh, policy document a number of years ago. So, um, you know, there's a lot uh, in the recommendations that we have here that, um, you know, that, that certainly was included in, in our, our own document. Um, I think it's, it's important to note, I think, that, you know, most people who gamble, you know, they do it responsibly and they do it so socially. Um, or sociably, but um, you know, unfortunately, we have seen a, a massive increase um, in the instances of problem gambling right across um, these islands. So it's something that we do need to be taken seriously and, and really tackled. Um, the uh, some of the recommendations um, are, are definitely welcome in terms of the, the levy. Absolutely, it has to be a polluter pays um, type model similar to, to that they have in um, New Zealand. Um, the age verification is so important because. Um, you know, I think there's like a 72 hour window before you have to actually produce um, identification when you're when you're gambling online. So I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't go into a bar um, if you were chancing your arm and you're underage. You wouldn't go to a bar and drink for for three days before the proprietor um, asks you for you know to produce ID. So that's definitely welcome as well. The only thing I would say is you know certainly from our own point of view, um, our own party point of view, we would like to see. Um, you know, some action in terms of the FOBTs, fixed odds bet terminals, um, you know, and a, you know, a, a phased a, a approach, a phased approach into actually phasing those out completely. Um, so, I mean, there's lots in this that, that, that's very welcome. Society um, lotteries in that case as well. I know there's um, lots of clubs and societies that really struggle with the stake in terms of those society uh, lotteries. We know that they need those those lotteries to order to, to revenue raise. Um, so, if a, if a if you get down to some questions, then I appreciate what the chair said that this is not, uh, you know, this is just a, a brief overview. We don't have, uh, we're not going to be drilling down. But I just have a few questions in terms of the um, 
in terms of the uh, you know the regulator, because I think I would be very um, I, I'd be adamant that any regulator would, would have to sit outside of the department in, in order to maintain that sort of that level of um, accountability. Um, so. You know, if and when we get to the stage where we have, um, and hopefully we do, um, a regulator, a gambling regulator, is that something that the department would agree with in terms of um, them actually sitting outside the department and having that um, that sort of level of autonomy? Um, so just if there's any, um, any information just in, in relation to that. Um, the... One issue I do have um, is, and this has come up during our um, consultations with, with the industry when we were putting together this document, um, and it's in relation to, uh, I suppose, the hospitality industry, the tourism industry, um, and a lot of, uh, you know, um, arcades and things, especially around border areas, um, would actually get their machines from the south, so they're programmed as part of the regulations in the south. Um, so I think there's a bit there's a bit of concern just among that that side of the industry, um, that if the stakes and prizes are, are brought in line with what's in the UK, that would have put those um, you have Bundor and you have we have Newcastle here in South Down, you know those sort of tourist um, industries where there's tourist places where people come. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of concern among among the industry there that. They would like to see, um, you know, regulation island wide in terms of Ireland, and um, that we were brought into line with with the rest of the island, as opposed to bring it in line with the UK, which would put those areas at a disadvantage. So, um, listen, on the whole, I didn't see the changes being brought brought through, and the sooner we can get them, um, those amendments made, the better. Yeah, th thanks, Sinead. Um, on, on the regulator, the, the minister's already said that, that, that she does see the, in, the um, regulator being independent, which would, would mean it was outside of the department. And I think that would be uh, in line with international best practice. Um, uh, our, ourselves and, and the South are, are two of the very few jurisdictions left that don't have independent regulators. Um, so that, that would be uh, certainly the way forward in phase two. On the gaming machines, as I understand it, the, the vast majority of machines being used uh, here are, are supplied from Great Britain. Um, but I mean, again, that would be a matter for the committee to, to, to scrutinise. Uh, the difficulty for machine operators here is that our stakes and prices are so low um, that they, they, they have to try and sort of, uh, sort of cannibalise old machines to try and keep them operating under the current restrictions that we uh, impose, uh, whereas newer machines, which, which customers see much, as much more attractive, uh, can't be legally used here. Um, and I know in, in the South, I mean, a lot of their regulations are very out of date as well, um, and, and they, are, they are looking at, at reform there. Okay, is that you? That's Sinead finished? It must have been, yep, yeah, okay. Um, members, I have then Alex and then Fra. So, can we bring in Alex, please? Go ahead, Alex. Hi. Okay. Um, I don't know how I'm going to explain this to you, but I'll try. But thank you for your presentation. Um, one of my weak queries is I've had over the years people coming to me complaining um, about the gambling laws to do with banks and that banks are maybe doing competitions for their customers. So we like maybe the, the Halifax will do something in the rest of the UK. But because of our gambling laws in Northern Ireland, they can't give the same stuff to um, um, people in Northern Ireland um, who are using the same bank. Um, it's all down to the gambling laws. Uh, is that going to be addressed under this or the second stage, if that makes yeah. sense? Yes, um, there is uh, there is a proposal uh, that we're looking at too. What we would like to do is to make it easier for residents here generally to participate. I think you're referring to promotional prize competitions and so on and draws, and make it easier for people here to participate in those on the same basis as uh, people who live in other jurisdictions, uh, including some of the, I think you're possibly thinking of the Halifax competition and so on. Um, so there, that's that's part of the, the present proposals as well. Okay, uh, that's good news. That's, that's the only question I needed. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Um, if I could bring in Fra, and then we've got Mark. So Fra next. Sure. Uh, th thank you very much. And again, thank you to the uh, 
uh, the, the people for the, the, the presentation. Uh, and uh, it's very, very interesting because you and I would know that, uh, that we have spoke about uh, gambling over this past number of years and uh, without it being moved forward. And I think the crucial thing is that, uh, that uh, and like, like the licensing laws, that uh, we were dealing with, with things that had an impact in the past and we needed to bring it into the future. But the, uh, I, I do believe that even though it's a small bill uh, or small piece of legislation, I think what it does, it, it shows the intent uh, of the Assembly to finally uh, move uh, to provide legislation that allows you to deal with this here. Uh, I'm glad to see uh, that the, 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 the question of illegal gambling uh, as in, and uh, that the the the, uh, the open, and it's opening up the the, the Sunday gambling uh, because you, you, over the years you talk to people uh, who uh, may uh, took uh, had a bet uh, or gambled on some of the illegals only to find that the size of the pot that they won that the person wasn't able uh, that Donald wasn't able to, uh, to to pay out and they lost out. As a matter of fact, uh, within, and, uh, interestingly, you were listening to a case there in England uh, some weeks ago where there was a, a run into uh, several million and it was a lengthy uh, court case. So the uh, uh, all, all of this seemed to work well for, for those that uh, provide gambling houses and not for the pundit uh, that, uh, that 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 does the small uh, bet. So I, I think that 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 that's, that's a good thing. But uh, like Sinead, I think that it's essential that the uh, that the the the, the, administ the administrator uh, of the thing is uh, is in the, uh, independent. The regulator, sorry, is is uh, is independent uh, to do other uh, sends out all the wrong messages. Uh, to the thing, and it's the same with the the, the, the levy. I think that, that 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 needs to be independently controlled and run also, and uh, because then it would uh, remove any taint if, if, if that's possible of uh, where where not not where the money's coming from, but who is to say and where it goes to. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Fra. Uh, and uh, the, as I said earlier, you know, it's international best practice that any regulator uh, should be independent of government. Um, and, and on the issue of of contracts, gambling contracts being enforceable in law, I think I think that is good news for for punters and, and consumers generally. Uh, I mean, in, in this day and age, uh, relying on a gentleman's agreement for someone to pay out, uh, while it hasn't been hugely problematic here, it, it, it could well be. Okay, Fra. Is way. Okay, thank you. Um, can then I ask that Mark be brought in, please, Mark? Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the officials for the presentation. A couple of the points that I have been going to make have been, including the one Alex made about the exclusion of uh, people here in Northern Ireland from from competition to not being run by banks and building societies. But I'm glad, like, like everyone, to see some action being taken. It's not a, a whole bill. I'm also glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think we shouldn't be complacent about the fact that because it's not as big a piece of work as it might have been, that it's going to be easy for us to get through and you know, that there aren't going to be issues to the rise uh, during the committee stage and, and, and beyond and what comes back from consultation on this. As regards the, the levy, uh, one point I would make, we've spoken before about online gambling and that is a major, major problem, if not the major problem uh, when it comes to gambling. Is it envisaged that there be any sort of recourse to extract the levy from online betting companies? Because the, the, the danger would be here, and I was chatting to a guy who, who works in the bookies the other day, just bumping them in the street, and he was saying how they could, you know, back open for a few weeks post lockdown and that, and it's dead. You know, uh, he said anyone who wasn't online before is online now, and, and uh, it would be important that the level of that levy is right. Yes, we, we want the money coming in and being directed to help people affected by or, or the, the, by the, the harm that uh, gambling can and, and certainly does cause 
I mean, the individuals, if you don't want to say it at a level where the, the only people being helped for it are those who are open here, those who are employing people here, those who are paying rates here, while you have your bet three, six, five, who, whose chief executive can pay herself over 500 million pounds last year, to, to, to just uh, say it on the way it's got free. Yeah, um, Mark, I think you're absolutely right. Um, while this isn't the full reform of gambling that, that is probably required, it will still be difficult uh, to, to get this through within the time we have available. And I've no doubt that there will be huge interest whenever the committee goes out with their call for evidence. Uh, and you'll have all sorts of interest and stakeholders wishing to come forward and, and give evidence to the committee and, and have their voices heard. Um, on on the, the levy, I think you're absolutely right that we need to set the level levy very carefully. Uh, we'll need a, a lot of research before it's finally set. And we need to look at targeting online providers as well as, as the local um, uh, shops and, and, and amusement arcades and so on. So that, that, that's something, as, as Kieran discussed earlier on, that we will do through secondary legislation. But we'll also have to do uh, serious research into what level it should be set at. OK. Thanks, Liam. OK, Mark, thank, thank you. Is that you finished, Mark? Yeah, OK. All right, there's no other members have raised their hands to ask any further questions. You'll be very glad to hear. Um, look, thank you so much. Um, I look forward, as I say, to getting that, that, that blue booklet in my pigeonhole and uh, starting off on, on, a, on a new bill again. Um, look, thank you so much, Liam, um, Martina and Karen, for being with us today. And I'm sure we'll see you in the not too distant future. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. All right, all right, members. Um, uh, just before we move on to our next um, agenda item, can I just propose we just take a very quick break to prepare for that? Thank you. Twenty-nine. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room Twenty-nine. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room. 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is okay, uh, members, we're going to move on then now to agenda item six, which is a briefing by the independent review panel of charity regulations. Remember, you'll find uh, you'll find this at uh, page fifty three of your meeting pack. Then, can I welcome to the meeting um, Una Brain, Noel Lavery, and Reverend Dr. Leslie Carroll. These are all very welcome um, to the meeting today. Um, uh, is it yourself, Una, that's going to begin with your brief, if you want to go ahead? And thank you for waiting on us. Thank you, thank you Chair. I, I hope you can hear me okay. I can indeed. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the panel, thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee this morning and to hear your views on the key issues for the panel's independent review of charity regulation. Um, as the Chair said, my name is Una Breen. I'm a professor of law at the Sutherland School of Law, University College Dublin. In terms of my own background, I obtained my doctorate in law from Yale Law School and my area of expertise is comparative charity regulation and governance. I'm currently the president of the International Society for Third Sector Research and a former chair of the International Centre for Not-for-Profit Law. I'm joined on the panel by Reverend Dr. Leslie Carroll, who is the Prisoner's Ombudsman for Northern Ireland, and by Mr. Noel Lavery, who is a former Permanent Secretary, most recently at the Department for the Economy. We were appointed by Minister Hargey to carry out this review in late January, and we received our approved terms of reference on March the 3rd. Our task, as set out by those terms of reference by the Minister, which we previously shared with the Committee, is to examine how well the regulatory framework for charities is working here and how it might work better through further, further reform. The review provides a useful opportunity to take stock of the implementation of the Charities Act 2008 to date how, and to look in light of best practice throughout these islands as to how to achieve good regulation in the key areas of charity registration, reporting, compliance, and the deterrence of mismanagement and wrongdoing. The importance of the charity sector in Northern Ireland should not be underestimated. As the, as the committee may be aware, there are currently 6,683 charities who have completed the charity registration process with the Charity Commission. Based on research completed by the Charity Commission in 2020, we know that 72% of these organisations provide a benefit across the breadth of Northern Ireland. A further 3% work locally in a specific council area. A further 10% operate across the island of Ireland. 6% work in the UK and a further 9% work internationally. Their annual incomes range from the highs of £377 million pounds in one case to those with just a couple of hundred pounds in their bank accounts in many others. Again, as the committee is probably already aware, 73% of charities have annual incomes of less than 100,000 pounds, while 28% of charities have an in annual income of 5,000 pounds or less. The advancement of education is by far the most popularly occurring charitable purpose. It's closely followed by the advancement of citizenship or community, though it's not unusual for charities to have more than one charitable purpose. And given this focus on education, it's perhaps not surprising that almost half of registered charities identify children or youth as their beneficiary class. Those entrusted with the control of charities, the people we typically refer to as charity trustees, 
number almost 58,000 individuals in Northern Ireland, according to the Commission. That's before we even count the contribution of those who are employed in the charity sector or who otherwise volunteer with charities. While this may speak to the importance of the sector, you shouldn't lose sight of the value that the charity sector brings to society more generally. Charities facilitate the use of private goods for public benefit. Their activities benefit not only the beneficiaries directly, but also the community more generally at large. The activities that they engage in are a source of vital social capital. It's vital for community and voluntary efforts, and they offer opportunities for leadership and growth. The introduction of the 2008 Act was intended to provide the regulatory scaffolding to support and enable these organisations and their charity trustees. It was to enable full visibility of good work and to protect charitable funds for charitable purposes. In our letters of March the 9th and March the 13th to the community, we advised you of our plans to engage in extensive uh, engagement with stakeholders so as to hear firsthand from charities, donors, beneficiaries and the public more generally on their lived experiences of charity regulation. To update the committee on our work so far, to this end, through the month of April, we've undertaken nine community webinars in conjunction with NICFA, the Charity Law Association, the Ulster Society of Chartered Accountants in Ireland and the Funders Forum. These webinars were attended by more than 300 individuals who shared their views on key regulatory issues with the panel. From April the 12th to May the 12th, we invited the public to share their written views with us through an online questionnaire which addressed the discrete terms of reference and that we were asked to consider. This recently closed consultation resulted in just over 140 written submissions and the analysis of these will further inform our deliberations and our report over the coming weeks. We hope that committee members had the opportunity uh, to avail of the online questionnaire to convey their views to us but of course, we will take on board this morning any further views expressed by the committee uh, today as well. In addition to both the community webinars and the online questionnaire, the panel has undertaken a further 17 engagement meetings with key stakeholders, amongst which are included the Charity Commission, the Department for Communities, the Irish Charities Regulatory Authority, uh, the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, the Charity Commission for England and Wales, and an additional meeting with representatives of Loch Ney Rescue and the Disabled Police Officers Association of Northern Ireland. In carrying out these many listening exercises, we have tried to be as inclusive as we can in our fact-finding processes. For transparency purposes, we would also plan to publish the written submissions that we receive at the end of our process. Chair, I'd like to emphasise again that in meeting with the charity regulators elsewhere in these islands, our intention has been to identify and to learn from best practice where we find it. So if I may turn to substance for a moment, the terms of reference specifically ask us to examine whether the Charities Act and the Commission's efforts within the four corners of that Act strike the right balance in light of best practice between supporting charities to achieve their charitable mission fully and effectively, um, and also to effectively deter or deal with misconduct. In carrying out this examination, we're asked to report to the Minister on the delivery of the regulatory framework to date, including the effectiveness of the current regulator in delivering on its agreed objectives and statutory functions, and further options for optimal charity regulation in Northern Ireland. To this end, the panel has sought input on eight discrete areas. And these areas include very briefly the matter of registration. As the committee will be aware, currently all charities in Northern Ireland are required to register. And we are looking at how well that registration process is working and whether it needs to be reformed to work better. We're also looking at the issue of annual reporting. 
and whether the existing reporting regulations are sufficiently proportionate and whether full possible use is made of the filed information. We're looking at day-to-day -day engagement with the Commission. How do charities typically encounter the regulator and what has that experience of engagement been like? We're also examining compliance procedures and looking at how effective is the Commission's active monitoring of charities. We look at investigation powers. As the committee is aware, the commission is required by the Charities Act to be a proportionate regulator, only taking action where action is needed. And we're interested here particularly in looking at whether the commission has the right investigation tools and whether it uses them fairly. We're also looking at enforcement and appeals. And in this context, we're considering whether the regulatory framework envisaged in the Act is still appropriate and if it's in line with best practice and developments across England and Wales, Scotland and Ireland. Um, there's been much talk about uh, delegation powers and we know that the department has already briefed you on the uh, forthcoming legislation to amend the Charities Act in this regard. <clears throat> For the purposes of the panel's review, we're interested in understanding what powers should be capable of delegation from commissioners to staff in line with best international practice. Finally, we're also looking at the department's role in charity regulation. As the owner of the regulatory framework and the sponsor department of an arm's length body, we're considering whether there are gaps in the regulatory framework that need to be filled. And currently, there are uncommenced provisions of the Charities Act in the area of charitable incorporated organisations, for example, in the area of the introduction of Section 167 institutions, by way of another example. And there may be other statutory amendments that the panel will review and say change could happen here. Our work in this area will also include a review of the governance framework agreed between the Department and the Commission and which must flow from the legislation in both spirit and letter. The terms of reference also indicate those matters that fall outside of our remit. Thus, the panel is not revisiting decisions in individual cases uh, that have been the subject of litigation before the Northern Ireland High Court and the Court of Appeal. These decisions are currently the subject of a separate review by independent counsel. Having said all of that, uh, the committee will appreciate that we have been given an ambitious agenda and we are now on a tight time scale to deliver our report to the Minister by late summer. As we appear before the committee today, we are awaiting the collation of the quantitative and qualitative information provided in the online survey. We will need to complete a full analysis of that information and to reflect on its findings alongside what we've received in terms of written submissions and via our meetings and our webinars and um, before we will be in a position to brief the minister on foot of our review or to prepare our final report for her. Chair, let me conclude this opening statement by expressing thanks to everyone who has taken the time to engage with our review process to date. I would also like to take this opportunity, if I may, to publicly thank NICFA for its facilitation of our webinars. Chair, we're eager to hear the committee's views and to use this opportunity to answer any queries on our process that the committee may have. We're a little unused to our leaf, uh, but we will endeavour to work within its constraints so that you have the opportunity to hear and meet each of the panel members this morning. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. You know, we're, we're well used to Starleaf and not a week goes by that there's not an issue or a problem. So um, let's hope that to, we'll, we'll be fine here this morning. Like, thank you for that. Um, can I just remind members, if they want to ask questions, can they please use their um, hands up button function? The only person we have at the minute is, well, no, hi Alex and then Kelly. Um, I just want to just start off with just a few questions. The first one is around the, 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 the terms of reference. And, and that you know that that balance of supporting um, charities, um, but also uh, deterring uh, from misconduct. Um, do you feel at this stage that you're getting that information that you need um, to, to deal with that and co with confidence? As I said, chair, at the start, we, we've 
tried to be as inclusive as we can in terms of those we've met. We've received a lot of information. We're still processing that information. We will probably have further questions that we will need to ask as we put the answers and the, the, the matrix together. We will probably have further questions. We will go back to the Charity Commission as we get a better understanding of where we stand. But we would hope by the time that we come to write our report that we will be able to make recommendations in this space. It's a really important issue for every regulator. The regulatory art is all about that balance of um, enforcement where enforcement is necessary, but also encouragement of your sector so that they come along with you because you never have enough resources to um, force everybody to do the right thing. You would much prefer there to be that um, momentum of compliance in the sector, and, and that's what we're trying to get a better handle on. And I suppose I'd just follow up from that, the, the, the evidence gathering and the data gathering. Um, and you'd mentioned there the, the nine community webinars and over 140 submissions. Um, we know that these have been uh, difficult times and extraordinary times in, in trying to hold those meetings and trying to, to gather that evidence. Uh, though I do think there is a plus point as well where um, in doing so, you maybe uh, people uh, can attend because it is through a webinar or or whatever just to just how do you think how successful has that been and then just then again and i know you're probably this again is something you probably cannot answer but i want to ask it anyway just is there any emerging themes that you can share with us at this stage uh, well to start, start start with the first part of your question relating to the webinars uh, I think we've all become such a, a virtual uh, world. Uh, it's real Star Trek and being the Scotty this weather uh, entirely. And I think it, you're right. The, the, the timing of the webinars, the fact that people are working from home, perhaps in some ways, and benefited us in terms of running the webinars because people were able to come along, they were able to contribute. We held a number um, at lunchtime to facilitate people in terms of their work hours. We held an evening session to facilitate people uh, who would not perhaps have been in the position to um, commute and meet us. So I hope I hope that we have been as inclusive as we can be um, and we widely advertised our um, online questionnaire which was also an opportunity uh, to follow up after the webinars itself. I, I don't know whether Noel or Leslie have any points before I move to the second issue of um, uh, the posed by the chair just in terms of how, how inclusive you think the webinars were. Hey. But Chair, if I can come in just to say, you know, I, people who made the effort to be at the webinars were very engaged, and 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 you know, I guess if you if you do take that hour in, in between lunch and come, come in the evening, depending on how busy you are, I was actually very interested, very encouraged how engaged people were. Uh, you know, lots of people contributing, lots of people using the chat function. So I thought it was a very useful uh, exercise and. And um, you know, we wait to see uh, what comes in from the hundred and the hundred and forty submissions we received. We also received a number of written submissions as well as that. So I, I would I, I would describe it as a very positive and active engagement in those webinars. To come to your second point then, um, Chair, in relation to emerging findings uh, and where we're at the moment, well, uh, as you appreciate, as I, I mentioned at the start, we haven't yet had the full opportunity uh, to forensically analyse the feedback from our stakeholder engagement. Um, it's very important, in fact, today that we hear the Committee's view on priority issues which would improve uh, the framework and its operations. So we're, we're very interested in, in what members have uh, to say to us today today in this respect. Um, certainly, as Noel has said, we were very encouraged by the participation from a broad range of stakeholders. It's a wonderful opportunity to hear from charities of different sizes who have different issues affecting them. We, we've talked to the funders, we've talked to the rural charities, we've talked to those um, who are in the general public, perhaps a supporter or a volunteer or a donor, and everybody brings their own unique perspective to this. From our perspective as a panel, it's important that we reflect on best practice. 
and, and we learn what we can from other jurisdictions rather than reinvent the wheel when it comes to Northern Ireland. But it has to work here. So you can't just transplant in something and that would not be suitable for the conditions of regulation in Northern Ireland. So I guess, uh, and I'm sorry, it's perhaps not, not as a direct answer as you might like at this point. Uh, there are certainly going to be recommendations across all of our terms of reference, but we haven't yet got to the a stage where I could share with you what those recommendations would be. And obviously we have to uh, brief the minister and discuss it with her uh, before we could go into that more broadly. No, like you know, thank you, and I appreciate that. I was chancing my arm a bit by by asking that question, but you'll appreciate that's what I'm here to do also. And just then on on the briefing for the minister, um, we led believe that's the fourth of June, uh, with the final report then being presented on the twenty sixth of July. Um, can I then just ask, um, are you on target then to meet those deadlines? We actually didn't receive our approved terms of reference until the 3rd of March, which was later than we expected. So we are now due to brief the Minister at the start of July, and we should have, we're working flat out every day in between. So I can't give you the date of the report yet, but I can certainly confirm that we are briefing the Minister on the 5th of July. So there's a four week lag on that. Yep, no, that's fine. Look, thank you for that. I'm going to open up to members. Um, we have uh, Alex and then Kelly, and again, remind members, anybody want to ask questions, can they please let me know? Um, Alex, over to you. Hi, um, thanks for your presentation. Um, obviously, um, I'm keen to see things move as quickly as possible, and, and we all want to have as much confidence in yourselves and, and the public and different charities and stuff. So. Um, I think the sooner this is done, the better, but obviously at, at a pace that is right for yourselves and everybody else, that, that's very important that everything's done properly. Um, the, the only thing in, in all of this, will this affect any cases that are currently being taken by the Charity Commission in, in terms of any investigations that they're doing, uh, or anyone that they're taking to court for? for issues, or will this not affect anything like that? That's my only question, Ali. Thank you very much, Mr. Easton, for, for that question. Um, I guess to go back to the, the purpose of the review, uh, we are to review the effectiveness of the regulatory framework in its entirety. Uh, and within that, we're looking at the role of the charity regulator. So our recommendations will very much be based on how things are done at the moment and how they can be done better in the future. So it, it's a forward planning process. And as you know, you have amending legislation coming already to tackle one of the issues, which is the delegation issue. And it may be that on foot of our report, there will be further recommendations for further statutory change uh, in the future as a result of our recommendations. But we're not looking at any individual cases um, in the course of our terms of reference. In fact, um, they're excluded from our consideration. So it wouldn't be the case that we would be commenting on a particular um, case that the, the Commission is taking or that has been taken against the Commission. And we are approaching this in the broader regulatory uh, framework space. Okay, Alex. All right, Alex, thank you. Um, then I'll bring in Kelly, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much, Una. I don't envy your task. It's a huge piece of work. It was a long time getting the existing legislation set up. Um, and just to, I suppose I should declare an interest, I worked in the community and voluntary sector for 16 years before becoming an MLA. Um, but what I wanted to ask you about is, obviously, we're all aware of the length of time that it takes for charity registration um, to complete. Um, I'm just wondering, as part of your investigation, will you be looking at what the barriers are to that completion, if it is an issue with how charities are completing the forms, or maybe it needs the Charity Commission itself needs to have more staff? Um, will you be looking at that just to see how we can address those those um, I suppose charity waiting lists? Absolutely, Ms. Armstrong. This is a key issue for the review because until you have a register of charities, 
you really can't that's the basis of everything in good regulation that's the basis on which you decide what your priority cases are that's the basis on which you have sight of the sector that you're regulating that you can plan um, around that that's the value of having having a good charity register it's not just a benefit to the charity commission or the charity that appears on it it's a benefit to government planners and policy makers when you get full visibility of the sector it's important for funders funders turn to the register as a source of comfort and assurance and um, when they're deciding who to make grants to and um, even to encourage uh, and as a community activist uh, you're, you're so well aware of this i know i'm preaching to the converted in this space you know to see the charities that are in your area whether they're big or small who needs help if you are about to set up a new charity in the morning it's great to be able to go to the register and see are you actually could you just join an existing charity as opposed to you know uh, create a, a competing entity so there's so many reasons why charity regulation registration is core it's your starting point and so this is indeed a key issue for the panel. It's something we've heard a lot about in our webinars. And we've heard the frustrations of those who are on the list waiting a long time to be registered. Uh, and it is something upon which we will be making recommendations. Thank you. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about that registration is um, the red tape. I know that you do have to prove um, your charity objectives. Um, it can take quite a lot, but as you've mentioned, there are charities who have millions of pounds in the bank and millions of pounds of turnover per year and there's others that have a very small amount. Um, will you be looking at a reasonableness, reasonableness level of how much um, registration documents will be required by different sizes of charities because it, for some that have employed staff it's a lot easier to go through the registration process because you have staff there who can commit their time to that but if you're only volunteers and all of your um, people who are involved with your organisation are all volunteers, they maybe don't have the capacity um, to, to complete that registration. Are you reviewing that angle of it? So again, I think this comes back to good regulation and to be a charity in the first place, there is a statutory test that you have to pass. And that, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what size you are, there are certain things that have to be in place before you have the privilege of joining the charity register uh, and we know that that's the gateway uh, because it opens you, you then have the privilege of being a registered charity but you also have the great responsibility uh, that comes in terms of the annual reporting which is something else we've heard a lot about from charities um, in our in our webinars so you, you do have to manage that um, correctly there has to be statutory standards there has to be a certain amount of information that's available before we put you on the register because once you're there, other responsibilities flow. So I wouldn't like to create an impression that you, you know, if you're small, that there are certain, you know, that there that you wouldn't meet the charity test, or that there might be um, a provision that would perhaps land you in greater difficulties as a registered charity with compliance and reporting further down the line. You can have many non-profits that do good work in Northern Ireland that don't necessarily have to be charities. It's only if you meet the charity test that you should find yourself on the register. So I think one of the challenges for us is to find that right balance. Once you meet the charity test, what are the procedures? And again, you're right, there are long waiting times at the moment, and we're looking at that to see how that can be expedited, how the combined list can be cleared, uh, and where the log jams, as you so nicely put it, exist in that space. Uh, so that is something we will be considering, um, and out of that will come our recommendations. But it would be premature for me today to say what those recommendations would be, uh, in light of the fact that we still have to read the um, submissions of those who are most affected by the, these issues that we're discussing. Thank you. My final question, um, just because I have been involved with governance of charities um, for a a large part of my um, career with, within the charity sector. Um, whenever charities were under Companies House, there would have been a requirement there that they had to be um, sustainable organisations and hold appropriate reserves, for instance, for redundancies um, and known liabilities. One of the things that I would be keen is for um, the, you know, the reports that you guys are bringing forward um, is that that protection 
of charities uh, or for charities is maintained and I know it's a bit of a strange way of putting it but for instance if the requirements um, are that a charity has to be sustainable so it has to have a reserve level that covers its known liabilities in the same way that it had to under Companies House it will stop funders from them forcing them to do a, or work to a zero balance at the end of every March um, because that makes sustainability of the organisation extremely difficult and as we know charities are existing on one year budgets so I was just wondering is there a thought on how we can protect charities through the registration um, to ensure that there is a level that we all understand that charities um, have to work to so if they have liabilities that they are expected or can have um, reserves that to protect their service delivery because they shouldn't be just working to deliver a funder's objectives they're delivering their own charitable objectives that they've registered with but if a funder forces them to work to zero balance um, that undermines the work of the charity is there anything being thought about that way that this registration or the, the regulation can actually help to protect our charities from questionable funders they might have a lot of money but they might have questionable practices it's again a very interesting question um, at the moment in uh, let me put it this way none of the charity regulators in these islands England and Wales Scotland Ireland or in Northern Ireland require a new charity that's setting up to have a minimum capital balance so it's very common in civil law countries so if you were setting up in France or Germany or any of the Eastern Bloc countries it'd be very common for them to say before you can become public benefit foundation you must have this amount of money at your back but we tend not to do that um, in common law countries uh, we tend to give charity trustees the autonomy uh, to run their charities because at the end of the day it's private money for public benefit uh, and so that hasn't been a requirement of any of the regulators in terms of a registration process now, the point you make is a very good one, but it's a much broader one than necessarily the review is concerned with today because reserves are so essential for any charity. And we've seen that over the COVID period. You know, those that had a piggy bank had a little bit of um, security in a way that those who are working on tight budgets and waiting for the next grant check to come in were really in difficulty when their other fundraising mechanisms were taken away from them as happened over the course of the pandemic and this is an issue in every jurisdiction um, charities never have the opportunity to build up reserves funders particularly public funders are demons for um, making you spend down they almost think that if you have money in your bank account that you should be using that for your services as opposed to good sustainability and um, good longevity of your charity so we always want our charities to be going concerns uh, this is really really important but it's a broader issue than necessarily one that the panel is dealing with here Okay, so there wouldn't be anything then about governance that um, would require trustees to understand sustainability and um, reserve policies and, and so on. I absolutely agree with you. How can you set up a charity with money if you're not already a charity? That seems, but it, as soon as you have resources, then there will be replacement or there may be redundancy start to build up. There could be pensions, there could be oh, so many things that are tied into to charities, the same as companies. Uh, but yeah, it's it's... What we've seen um, coming up till now has been that funders look absolutely to the register to see who's a legitimate charity. Uh, they also, instead of asking charities to constantly submit annual um, accounts, that they can actually look to the register and see if the annual accounts have been submitted. It saves charities a lot of time and hassle. But unfortunately, because nobody's looking at the sustainability of a charity um, and whether or not the governance knows to look after that sustainability um, through reserves or through protecting the business model, um, it means then that there are some charities that funders tend to ask them to use their own money for purposes that, that the, the govern the, the trustees have decided to save that money for um, and that could be redundancies um, and they're asking them to use that instead of funding them for cost recovery for instance but you no know, it'd be interesting to see um, what you come up with in the end anything to be honest that can improve our system at the moment it's it's not a, a very bad system and don't get me wrong but um, it, it, just to improve it for the staff in the Charity Commission and for our charities. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Okay, no other member has indicated that they want to ask anything um, further at this stage. So I'll just then say thank you um, to Una Noel and Leslie um, for coming in and briefing us today. Uh, no doubt we'll have you back then, um, September, October, whenever you'll be able to talk a bit more about your findings. And uh, that would be good. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, members. We're then going to move on to agenda item seven. Can I then uh, propose that we go into closed session um, to discuss this LCM? Um, members agreed with that? I know none of you are in at the moment. Do you agree to it? Can we bring you all in first? Yeah, okay. I see a thumbs up. So we're going to go into closed session for just agenda item seven. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly there, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. Okay, members, we're going to now move into Agenda Item 8, which is a raised briefing on sport research papers. You'll find um, the papers for this item at page 107 of your meeting pack. And then can I then welcome Karen McCallion to the meeting today. Um, Karen, I, I think the way we're going to do this, it is... Oh, where is Karen? Oh, she's in. Karen, we're going to um, go ahead and if you want to brief on both the papers together... And then we'll we'll do a, a question and answer session at the end of that, okay? Okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members. Um, so today I'm going to provide a summary of two research papers that were completed in January 2021. Um, you'll find the paper on sport and disability begins at page 107 of your packs. Um, I'll start this part of the briefing by setting out the key statistics for sport participation and disability in Northern Ireland. Um, then I'll describe the evidence base for the benefits of sport participation, as well as some of the common barriers for people with disabilities. And then I'll highlight some relevant strategies and policies, including a brief overview of relevant parts of the department's new draft strategy for sport and physical activity in Northern Ireland. So definitions of sport and physical activity, as well as the chief medical officer recommendations are detailed on page 117 of your packs. Um, so to save time, I'll, I'll not describe those in, in, in detail now. But in terms of key statistics, um, people with disabilities in Northern Ireland have the lowest sport participation rates compared with neighbouring jurisdictions. And in Northern Ireland um, has the highest prevalence of disability in the UK. So according to the Labour Force survey, one in every five adults, um, that's just, just over 21%, um, aged between 16 and 64 years old, has a disability in Northern Ireland, where the proportion of people with disability in the UK is 17.4%. So if you turn to page 121 of your packs, comparing participation levels between 2010 and 2020, people with disabilities in Northern Ireland are still um, almost half as likely to regularly participate in sport and physical activity compared with people without disabilities. And people with disabilities who are over the age of 50 are the group that are least likely to be physically active. And this is of note considering that the median age of the population is increasing and the adverse medical consequences of physical inactivity are becoming increasingly understood. Also, the continuous household survey demonstrates that the gap between disabled and non-disabled members of sports clubs is also widening. So in terms of the benefits of participating in sport and physical activity, the chief medical officer recommends 150 minutes of physical activity accumulated over the course of each week. The CMO's guidelines also suggest that the risk of progression of disabilities affecting the basic activities of daily life is almost halved for those who undertake regular moderate intensity physical activity compared to those who do not. So the research findings about the barriers to participation in sports and physical activities can be divided into three categories. And these are environmental, such as access to facilities, lack of transport and per community capacity, social, including attitudes that might risk sports participation for certain groups, as well as the attitudes and actions of um, leisure managers and, and policy makers, and personal barriers such as a lack of money, time, poor confidence, and a negative body image. 
Sport Northern Ireland, in partnership with Disability Sport NI, aims to increase participation rates among people with dis disability by six percentage points between 2009 and 2019. Although this target appears to be met, the size of the gap in participation levels between people with disabilities and those without has remained largely static during that time. Also, recent research by Sport England has shown that COVID-19 restrictions have had a particularly negative impact on sporting and physical activity participation levels for those with a disability. And the data for the past year is not available as yet for here. So in terms of funding for disability uh, sport, it's increased almost tenfold since 2009 in Northern Ireland. Much of this has been invested in elite sport, according to Sport NI. Elite athletes with disabilities applying for funding do so through their sports governing bodies. The Sport NI Fund for Elite Sports is the Sporting Clubs and Sporting Winners Investment Programme, which ran from 2017 um, through to 2021. Sport NI's Disability Action Plan aimed to fund at least 13, adults, or 13 athletes over the course of three years. According to Disability Sport NI's annual report, four athletes received funding during 2019 to 2020. So according to a 2018 study commissioned by Sport NI, the elite sport expenditure totaling 4.31 million was two thirds supported by, uh, by the national lottery sources and the remaining one third from government. Of that 4.31 million uh, of funding for elite sports, 6% or 240,000 uh, was spent on disability sport, which is about 6% of the total. So in terms of participation and performance at international level, the number of athletes from here competing in the Paralympics increased from three to eight participants between 2000 and 2016. And the number of medals won by um, NI athletes at the Paralympics rose from one to six within that same time scale. Potential issues uh, raised for consideration by researchers who completed a social exclusion study for the Northern Ireland Executive Office in 2015 suggested that some potential issues for disability sport participation in Northern Ireland included exclusion due to access to facilities and equipment, that the highlighting of different kinds of provision may actually reinforce negative differences between people with disabilities and non-disabled people, that a lack of specialist staff in sports venues who understand the needs of those experienced disability can facilitate involvement in activities and can facilitate involvement in activities as well as the cost of participating. So for example, sports that require specialist equipment and additional staff support can be a barrier. In terms of transport availability to sporting venues and competing time constraints of caregivers and helpers is also an issue. And segregation between governing bodies and funding bodies. And then a lack of media representation. So coverage tends to be restricted to competitive sports at national and international levels. And this can create an impression that disability sport is only for those at the elite end of the spectrum. So in terms of the strategies addressing disability and sport provision in Northern Ireland, these have tended to focus on merging disability sport organisations and their participants into non-disabled sporting organisations through a policy called mainstreaming. Research has highlighted that to be inclusive, sports and physical activity programmes should have a number of features. And these include affordability, appropriate scheduling of events and activities, strong policies on violence, harassment and equity, skilled and sensitive leadership, and a role for participants in decision making. A study by Ulster University in 2019, evaluating some mainstreaming uh, sporting programmes in Northern Ireland, concluded that specific targets and supports for sports clubs on how to approach the implementation of mainstreaming policies was required. Consultation with people with disabilities is recommended before creating new disability sports programmes and outcomes rather than just outputs should be considered when setting targets. Since Ulster University study, the Northern Ireland Sport and Human Rights Forum was created and launched in May 2019. Ulster GAA, Ulster Rugby and the Irish Football Association are among its members. And the forum was set up to facilitate the exchange of knowledge and good practice on sport and human rights issues. Next, I'll briefly describe some specific initiatives for sport disability provision in Northern Ireland, and these can be found on page 139 of your packs. So I'll first describe active living, no limits. Um, the following recommendations from the midterm review of the Department for Community Sports Matters strategy in 2016, the active living, no limits strategy was published. This provided a co-design framework for 1.1 million of investment and a cross department um, project board to oversee the achievement of the 17 actions that were identified. And these actions were identified following consultations with people who have disabilities and their carers. In terms of relevant 
the Disability Discrimination Act of 1995, as amended by the Disability Discrimination Northern Ireland Order 2006, places duties on public authorities when carrying out their functions to have regard to the need to promote positive attitudes towards people with disabilities and to encourage participation by people with disabilities in public life. The Sport NI Disability Action Plan for 2012 to 2015 and the Active Living No Limits Strategic Framework 2016 to 2021 described measures designed to fulfill the body's statutory commitments, including the dis a disability mainstream and policy and contracting the services of Disability Sports Northern Ireland for the delivery of various aspects of their dis disability action plan. So Disability Sport NI have said that although legislation has helped develop provisions for Disability Sport Northern Ireland, more work is required. Since 2014, Disability Sport NI activities to develop provisions here have included the development of the Active Living No Limits strategy, the creation of disability sport hubs in all 11 district councils, an inclusive sport award achieved by 10 of Northern Ireland's sport governing bodies, improved wheelchair basketball and watch programmes, and 20 inclusive sport facility accreditations. Despite these achievements, people with disabilities still remain half as likely to participate in sport and physical activity as non-disabled people in Northern Ireland, and disability sport has suggested that to su sustain and build on the previous achievements, access to more sports in more places is required. Also, according to Disability Sport NI, targeted support for inactive older people is a key issue, given the particularly low participation levels of people who are over 50 years of age and have a disability. You can see this illustrated in figure three on page 123 of your packs. It's particularly relevant as uh, Disability Sport NI have suggested a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on the sport and physical activity pr participation levels of people with disabilities in Northern Ireland. And if you turn to the bottom of page 142 of your packs, some of the impacts of COVID-19 have been highlighted. And one indicator to note is that over one third of applicants to Sport NI's COVID-19 hardship, gra hardship grant reported a disability. So although there appears to have been almost a tenfold increase in funding between 2009 and 2019 for disability sport in, in Northern Ireland, the gap between participation levels for those who have a disability versus those who do not has remained static. Also, the continuous household survey illustrates the gap between the numbers of disabled and non-disabled members of sports clubs is widening. And although Sport NI reported in 2013 that increased investment had resulted in increased opportunities, the most notable advances have been in the areas of elite performance. So this leads to um, the Department for Communities draft sport physical activity strategy that has been out for consultation um, since this research paper was, was completed in January of this year. And the Department for Community's new 10-year sports and physical activity strategy will be cross-departmental and focus on linkages between sport and physical activity and other policies of the executive. Three of the six themes listed in the draft strategy address participation directly. These include recovery from the impact of the pandemic on sport and physical activity, promoting participation, inclusion and community engagement, and providing inclusion and shared spaces and places. The resulting action plans, as well as the strategy's monitoring and reporting structures, are yet to be published. So next, I'll summarise the key findings about female participation in sport and physical activity in Northern Ireland. And you can find a copy of this paper at page 154 of your packs. So first, I'll describe the participation levels for different segments of the female population for Northern Ireland, and then I'll focus on how this compares with other jurisdictions. Then I'll outline what the barriers to female participation are and then lastly, I'll summarise some of the recent programmes and strategies that have been implemented to increase female participation, including a brief description of relevant themes in the Department for Communities draft strategy for sport and physical activity. So similar to the sport and disability paper, the definitions and the chief medical officer guidelines for sport and physical activity are outlined at the start of this paper, at starting at page 162 of your packs, but to save time, I'll, I'll not go into detail about these definitions now. So in terms of the key statistics, Almost half, 49% of the female population in Northern Ireland did not participate in sport during the year 2019 to 2020, according to NISRA's Continuous Household Survey. Children in Northern Ireland are reported as having the lowest levels of physical activity in the UK. And according to the 2019-2020 Young, Beha Young Persons Behaviour and Attitude Survey, the proportion of girls who said they enjoyed sport and physical activity a lot dropped from 65% when they're in year nine to 43% by the time they're in year 12, compared with 65% of year 12 boys. 
The Chief Medical Officer recommends accumulating at least 150 minutes of physical activity per week. Now, according to 2017 figures by the British Heart Foundation, Northern Ireland have proportionately more physically inactive adults compared to England, Scotland or Wales. And in 2019-2020, female adults in Northern Ireland were less likely to have taken part in sport over the previous four weeks. Just under two-fifths of females did at the day had taken part in sport compared to over a half of males. The percentage point difference between female and male sport participation levels has remained static over the past decade. So the reason why I mentioned these statistics is when comparing here with neighbouring jurisdictions, for example, the Republic of Ireland, their action plans to increase female participation tend to focus on reducing the gradient or the gap between female and male sports participation. Also, an outcome of the UK sporting future strategy was the Sport England's Active Live survey, and it now monitors the impacts of increasing sport and physical activity participation. And this includes changes to people's mental health and well-being, in addition to monitoring the participation figures. So NISRA's Continuous Household Survey does capture attitudes to sport and physical activity. And in 2019-2020, the survey showed that 43% of women said one of the benefits of participating in sport was to lose weight, while 74% said it improved their physical health, and 68% said it improved their mental health. But future considerations may include collecting data on the long-term relationship between participating in sport and, and health for here. And this will follow some of the new types of monitoring activity that are happening in neighbouring jurisdictions. So in terms of benefits, um, the importance of participating in sport and physical activity is outlined by the Chief Medical Officer's Physical Activity Guidelines. And physical activity is associated with preventing cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, depression and obesity. Studies have shown that the barriers to female participation can include a lack of confidence, poor health and injury, cost, access to facility and time. And according to the World Health Organization, disparities of participation in physical activity tend to be affected by gender, age, socioeconomic status, disability and pregnancy. Also change in priorities, particularly during the transition from primary to post-primary education. So this last point is highlighted in an Ulster University-led study where children aged 10 to 18 in Northern Ireland are reported as having the lowest rates of physical activity in the UK. And although 59% of girls surveyed were aware of the recommendation to take part in 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity per day, only 7% reported involvement in sport or physical activity every day of the previous week. Also, as outlined in figure two on page 166 of your packs, the gap between boys and girls' participation rates has widened between 2016 and 2019. So studies have shown that the factors influencing female participation in sport and physical activity include having support from friends and significant others, um, having an awareness of the physical activity guidelines, the presence of female role models and the media's representation of female sport, as well as having female coaches, leaders and volunteers, the membership of sporting clubs and female presence in governance structures. A recommendation repeatedly highlighted in female sport participation research is to focus policy interventions on those key life stages, including when children move from primary school to post-primary, when people leave education, when they have a family or when they retire from work. In 2014, the House of Commons Committee for Culture, Media and Sport held an inquiry titled Women in Sport. The inquiry examined the barriers to women's participation in sport and how to overcome these. And the focus of the inquiry included the availability of facilities for training and playing sport for both girls and women at grassroots and elite level. Um, finance, including sponsorship and prize money, media coverage of women's sport, female role models as elite sports women, managers and coaches, and the variety of sports on offer to girls at school. There doesn't appear to be recent data available about the difference in funding for, for females at elite level for here, um, compared to males, but according to a 13, 2013 study comparing male and female medal success between 1954 and 2010 at the Commonwealth Games, men had outperformed women on 11 out of 15 occasions. So in a recent All Island study of students' sports scholarships led by Univer Ulster University, more than twice as many scholarships were awarded to males compared to females. So a number of strategies and policies have been put in place to address the difference in participation levels between men and women. In 2016, the Female and Girls Active Fit in Sporty Strategic Framework was launched by the Female Sports Forum. This collaborative initiative is between women in sport and physical activity, Sported, Youth Sport Trust, Disability Sport NI and Ulster University. 
that targets the development of female-focused activity in the areas of media representation, leadership, role models, as well as female-focused research and evaluation. A key finding from a recent survey conducted by the Female Sports Forum um, was that respondents who were members of a sports club were 29% more likely to be active three to five days per week compared with those who are not sports club members. And the policy recommendations concluded from the survey responses included that additional support to governing bodies on how to recruit and retain female members would be of value, as well as improvement of sports facilities for women and girls who participate in high performance sport and more development of inclusive and accessible facilities, more mental health and well-being and body image interventions, as well as more visible role models at all levels of participation and more opportunities for social and recreational activities. Another initiative was Everybody Active. It was a four-year lottery funded program aimed to increase participation across the key life course transitions. And then another initiative is run by Sported. It was a five month pilot program with women in sport and its aim was to increase female membership of sporting clubs as part of um, Sport NI's Women and Girls Active Fit and Sporty program. This was called Engage Her and it was funded by the Department for Communities. And there are six workshops delivered by women in sport and the aim was to support the sporting clubs to just think differently about ways to engage um, female participants. So in terms of future strategies, the Department for Communities is currently drafting a new sport and physical activity strategy for the next 10 years. Webinars were recently held by officials from the Department for Communities as part of the consultation process. Um, and the inclusion of sport specific outcomes and indicators in the recent proposals for the programme for government for Northern Ireland were welcomed by officials at that webinar. So in the department's draft strategy for sport and physical activity, activity, officials highlighted that this was the first time physical activity rather than uh, physical recreation was included. And this means that both work and home based physical activities um, will be included in, in the monitoring of this as well. So Again, as mentioned previously, three of the strategy's six themes specifically address increasing participation. Um, and in terms of the approach to the new strategy, officials described a focus on collaboration, um, for example, through the joint use of facilities, but also as well as joined up thinking across departments um, in the implementation of the strategy. So officials also indicated that a cross de departmental project board have been set up with stakeholders from across the executive. So the next steps for the draft strategy's development is the delivery of action plans as well as monitoring and reporting structures and also Department for Community officials are planning to develop a digital system for the delivery of data related to the sport and physical activity strategy. So in terms of potential considerations resulting from this draft strategy, these might include finding out how participation levels be recorded and monitored, for example whether the focus will be on closing the gaps or gradients between male and female participants and whether impacts such as the relationship between sporting participation and mental and physical health will be monitored as well. And lastly, Sport Northern Ireland is also currently drafting its corporate plan for 2020 to 2025 and has identified that access to quality sporting experiences for women and girls, along with other underrepresented groups, must be improved. So according to the Department for Communities, Sport NI's future investment will align to better outcomes for women and girls, including a commitment to equal allocation of budgets provided to the female game. Um, the aim is to enable an increase in participation and representation of women at all levels. So thank you very much for listening and Chair, I'm happy to take any questions the members may have. Thank you very much, Karen. And that's a, an awful lot of detailed information. It is, it's pretty shocking, actually, the, the results that, you've, that you find um, when it comes to our participation in sport. Just before we can ask some specific questions, was there any um, a, a cohort of people within Northern Ireland at all that actually were doing better than anywhere else, did you find at all? When you were doing um, this, <laughs> well, I, 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 off the top of my head, I can't remember. But well, I think yeah. what I was trying to do was to, to focus in on on kind of where we had interventions and then um, what what the effects were those over the the past year. I suppose one of the things with the continuous household survey is the, the question changed. I think in twenty fourteen, so um, so it being able to sort of do a longitudinal look at, at the results um, was was a bit more challenging, but. Um, but I, I sort of welcome the information from the officials at the, the recent webinar for the new strategy for sport and that there'll be this um, digital system for, for getting more of that information and that data. 
No, look, thank you for that. That, that, that was just a by the by question. I wasn't expecting you to come up with a definite answer there. Yeah, yeah. It's just I just want to ask you about all of these initiatives that we have seen over the years. Um, have have any of them really been effective in any way from the, any of the of the evidence that you have seen? You know, have any of them actually made a really big difference? Um, to increase that participation, whether that has been in disability or whether that has been in, with children or women, um, you know, and, and, and have you, I suppose, uh, when you've been looking at this evidence, if there have been the ones or has been some that have made a, a real difference, um, uh, have they been replicated at all? I, I suppose for, from what I could find, I think that that's it, it's back to the the usual thing that I think we've we've talked about a number of times at, at previous meetings is, is getting the data about the impacts, the outcomes, rather than just participate. You know the 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 outputs, the number of people that that turned up, what happened after. That's that's difficult to find, and so it's pro it's it's probably quite difficult to comment on the lasting impact of some of these initiatives. I suppose at, at a at a, at a level, at a high level, um, the, the target of increasing participation by six percentage points, that has been met when you look at the continuous household survey. So in a collective fashion, all of these initiatives are having some sort of impact, but in terms of saying whether one had a, you know, had, had changed things dramatically, I, I don't have the, the information to, to, to be able to say that, you know, sort of um, uh, definitively. No, 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 that's fine. And just to, uh, I just want to ask you around the, 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 the recommendation from Sport NI of the uh, ensuring women are on boards. Um, we know, we certainly know here in the Assembly that if we have a more balanced representation of, of females uh, as elected members, um, we will see an increase on, on, on issues that, that affect not only females but families. In general, um, uh, we know that, and we know that is that is a good way of pushing uh, pushing forward certain initiatives. So, I mean, uh, it's only right that uh, that women on boards um, would have, would bring a specific uh, uh, in, in challenging these boards and sporting clubs um, for to increase the participation of women. Um, I, they, I think that what it says here that is that at the moment um, there is only three out of thirty six boardroom levels were held by women in Irish Football Association, Ulster GAA and Ulster Rugby. Um, do you know again if has there have you seen anything there that is showing any initiatives to improve that figure? I know we ran a we ran a, a programme here in the Assembly through Politics Plus over several years of, of, of promoting women on the boards. Um, we had one on our own board here in Politics Plus um, and that was an, an initiative very much the Assembly took forward. So is there any initiatives specifically for that that, that are, are being looked at or uh, do you know of any? Well, I, I think within the um, the women and girls act to fit in sporty that that's, there's one of leadership is one of the, the the tenants within that or the pillars within that. Um, I have recently completed some research looking at golf and um, gender equality um, specifically recently, and um, the the steer for increased um, uh, representation of of women on on the boards of governing bodies actually was coming from the, the, the governing bodies themselves. So that was um, in, in golf, that's the, the Royal and Ancient is the worldwide uh, governing body for golf. And um, they have created a women in golf charter. And one of the, the pillars of that is around leadership and, and presence in, in committees and governing bodies. Um, and what you've seen recently within um, golf in, in, on the island of Ireland is that um, the uh, the men's golfing go governing body and the and the women and the ladies golfing body has has amalgamated uh, in, in January of this year um, to create Golf Ireland and um, you know that th they have programs within that they're sort of asking clubs to sign up to the women in golf charter and um, then there's there's support and help and funding actually to to be able to bring the committees um, and the and the governing bodies up to speed with some of these and what this actually means. Um, and I think one of the things from doing that research um, is that for a number of sports, um, the, the, these, the, the members of these governing bodies would tend to be volunteers. So it's, it's also the, sort of balancing that side of things as, as well with, with, with these new initiatives and with changing things that um, maybe have been done for, for a long time over the years. No, 
Thank you, um, Karen, for that. Um, so far, there's a couple of members who want to ask a question. I see Sinead and Kelly. I would have expected it was definitely Sinead's hand to be up first, um, as she had brought up the, uh, the women in sports. So can we bring Sinead in? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so, no, listen, thank you so much, um, Karen, for the, the paper. It's, it's really good, but it's, it's a bit disappointing at the same time um, in terms of some of the findings. Um, and I suppose, like, you know, you, you could have anticipated that, um, just given what we know um, uh, about, about female participation in sport. And I suppose, for me, it's really a two-pronged approach. It's about education and it's about investment because um, I know uh, certainly things are definitely better than when when I was a young kid, uh, maybe getting involved in sport, I know my own daughters um, are, you know, playing football every Sunday morning. Uh, and out of 90 children, you know, three quarters of those are, are girls, believe it or not. But we know we have the issue further down the line when they when they reach puberty um, and, that, and that year 14, I think it was, um, age that we're losing them. So for me, a part... A huge part of this, um, and I'm glad you mentioned the the deep the, the joined up thinking across departments because, um, you know, a lot of this um, can be tackled uh, in the school setting, and we know um, when it comes to PE um, that it's not. We're told it's a core component of the curriculum, but it's not always treated as that. Um, and I know certainly that applies to um, to you know key stage one and right up the other key stages. Um, so either it is a core component of the curriculum or it's not. And I think that's where you, you really make that impression on, on girls um, that, you know, being fit, being healthy, being active is important um, and really make that make that a real key key element of the curriculum. Just up there, the same way maths and English and sciences, we need to make physical literacy, you know, a real, an actual core. We need to, we need to practice what we preach, um, really, is what I'm saying. So there's that there's also you know we have funding is a, is a major thing as well and um, you know i don't know from my own experience very often um women's teams and clubs have to fund they have the added pressure of, of having to fundraise whereas the men the men's teams don't don't always have that so that's another you know that's obviously another barrier as well so it's about investment and it's about making sure that um when when any so uh, Sporting Association receives funding that it's distributed equally among all the teams, and that should be um, a real core element in terms of what, you know when these uh, groups are applying for funding. That has to be a real um, a real key element, and that applies to you know when when uh, organisations are getting grants for, for example, new facilities. That it has to be accessible for their for their women's teams as well, because again, I know from experience that's not always the case, and that that brings you on to the sort of you know the can't see can't be. Um, campaign. So if, if girls aren't saying, or if, if I can't go to, um, you know, the local, my county ground here in Uri and I can't see the down, the senior down ladies play on it, you know, or my kids can't see that, you know, how are they going to aspire to that? So um, that's something as well. Um, you know, we have the recent success of the Northern Ireland women's soccer team, but, you know, how do we build on that? Um, what support are they going to get going forward? I know a lot of them are um, part-time or amateur, so they're heading into a major competition. How do we build on that? How do we inspire young young girls to say, look, I can do that, I can do that, that can be my profession, I can do that professionally, that can be something I can aspire to. Um, so, yeah, listen, again, I'm, I'm really I'm delighted to get the information in the paper. I'm not surprised by any of it, but I think we do need now to see, look, you know, maybe it's a, a, an opportunity for this committee to even you know, liaise with the Department for Education just around that piece on, on PE and maybe just get that sort of cross-departmental conversations happening and just make, making sure that that is a priority um, if, you know, for education just as much as it is for ourselves. Thank you. It, it might, just from the, the webinar I attended about the, the consultation process for the Department for Communities' new strategy for um, sport and physical activity, um, it, it might be it might be worth um, asking officials about um, the, the project board and some of the plans because physical literacy was actually one of the first points that was addressed um, with that and, and I know within the the, the proposals for the program for government um, the, the the focus on children and the connection to participating in sport is is mentioned specifically within that so that you know that might be something to um, to discuss as well, but they did mention there is a there is a project board that includes people from the Department for Education as well. So, okay, thank you, Karen. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Sinead. Um, Kelly. 
Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much, Karen. Um, as others have said, it's you know it, it's a huge piece of work. <clears throat> thank you for doing it, but um, it is quite disappointing when you see that not too much has changed. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, but what I wanted to ask you was, um, from looking through the information, and you've mentioned it already, um, where it seems to be that we're basing success with the number of people um, with disabilities or women in sport um, on outputs. And I'm just actually wondering if we're doing this wrong. Is there something maybe we as a committee could be asking more questions about? So how we measure success and rather than it being, um, you know, information about how many people play, how many people do it. It's, it's looking back at that section 75 measurement um, where departments will say we've done an equality impact assessment and we're not discriminating against anyone. If we actually flip that round on its head and said, OK, then look at the Section 75 groupings. How are we ensuring that each one of those groupings are being invested in to bring them all up to a level playing field so that they all have access to money, that they all have capacity building? Is that something that, that maybe could be a game changer um, for this committee to push forward with so that we're actually saying to departments, we'd want to hear any more how much you're not discriminating against, you know, minority groups or you know people with disabilities or women um what we actually want to see is how you are proactively investing and building programs to enable those people to reach levels you know as, as far as men's sport for instance could be is that something we should be considering karen would that change would that have changed how your report would have been written if that had been in play yeah, I think that that was one of the things that was quite noticeable um, in the, the in England, Sport England um, monitor those impacts and those connections. So it's that, you know, change in the dial um, uh, type of information that, that they are reporting on now within the Active Live survey. And one of the things they were actually able to do very quickly during um, from the beginning of the, the COVID pandemic is monitor and release information on those those changes, how, the, how those sort of indicators are changing, and not just from an output input basis. You know, it was it was kind of the, Im, the sort of impacts as well. And 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 I know in Scotland that what they're looking at within their plans is um, relating things to the the UN Sustainable Development Goals and things like that as well, which is again sort of looking at those um, beyond the the sort of stating sort of percentage in, 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 uh, increase of, of participation you know they're sort of looking again at how it's affecting the wider um, uh, sort of impacts of, of participating in sport um, one of the things that was mentioned at, at the webinar with officials and again it might be worth um, talking to them about this was um, with with the monitoring of data one thing that was mentioned was looking at social value um, but again you know trying to look at that in a way that um, you know, as, as you've described, sort of has 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 meaning. You know, sort of a, a meaning across departments and across strategies. Um, that's definitely something to sort of look at how that will be um, monitored. But sport did does come in does seem to come into three di different of the outcomes for the the new the, the proposals for the program for government. Um, but again, how that's measured or, or monitored, it definitely would be worth um, you know sort of looking at that because I. I personally find just being able to look at the monitoring process that um, Sport England have been doing since their new strategy, which I think started in 2015, um, that, that that has been really useful. Yeah, I think it's one way that we could encourage, um, you know, if, if we see that the amount of funding, for instance, that's being applied for um, is, is much less in, in women's sport and disability sport, are we looking at it just wrong? Should we say or sort of be saying, but actually, you know, they're applying for as much as is currently available, but do we have actually proactive measures in place to to affect a change? And I'm thinking about something like social prescribe or sorry, I uh, social prescribing as it is within health. Um, we know that before COVID and, and now during COVID, hopefully we're coming out of COVID soon, that um, mental health is going to be an issue and people just don't know where to go um, to access local sports. It might be blatantly obvious that there's a GAA club or there's a, a football club or, you know, there's there's whatever that's about, but it's getting into that. Whereas if we had social prescribing, as it was mentioned, I think it said about, you know, the well-being of, of being involved in sport and how good it is for you know, preventing cancers and so on, um, the social prescribing, it's not tied in 
with the funding for sport coming out of communities. So there seems to be a bit of a disjoint there on what could be an, a, a very successful outcome. Yeah, and, and, and one, one of the um, themes within the, the new strategy for, uh, for sport and physical activity is looking at awareness and promotion. And, and that was one of the things that was coming out of the research time and again as well, was that um, having an awareness of the fact that it's 150 minutes a week and um, although the guidelines have changed in, in the past year or the past year and a half as well in terms of how that 150 minutes is, is split up over the week, um, when, when people know that, then that, you know, kind of then has, a, has an impact as well. So um, those sorts of measures, you know, it would be useful too. Um, so, yeah, that's... The other one I just wanted to ask you very quickly, and this, this may not come forward, um, I'm very interested when it talks about, um, well, I'm very aware actually that Andy's um, with us and when he's um, a very famous athlete, um, but in disability sport, is there a breakdown of men and women? Um, is it just considered as sport for people who have disabilities or there is there actually a breakdown because i do have a concern that um women with disabilities are actually even worse off than than men with disabilities as well i i, I wasn't able to find it it may exist but um i definitely looked looked for that type of information um and i, I mean i think in terms of elite sporting success for disability um you know it, uh, the, the the female athletes um you know that that, that was it that was the information that was promoted that, that i was able to find but um yes in both um disability sport and um in non-disability sport the, the, the finding that breakdown of funding for male and female that that was that was difficult to find it may exist but i i wasn't able um to get it from the sources that i would usually look to Okay, no, that's great. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, brilliant piece of work. A um, lot of questions coming out of it, but I think there's there's potential solutions that the committee could could look forward to. Chair, I don't know if, if we would be allowed to do that, but could we perhaps ask the the department if they want to make comment on flipping that section seventy five consideration round so that it's not just about a. Um, an equality impact assessment that says who's not being discriminated against to actually looking at it in a different way to see who's actually being supported in order to achieve the outcomes. Oh God, Sean's just telling me something here from the back of the room. It's just suggesting to forward the two papers to the department for comment yeah. on the yeah. issues raised, then. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we will. We'll forward it through sure. the department for comment first and foremost on that. Um, any other members have any further questions or any comments they want to make to Karen? Don't see any hands up. No, that's grand. Um, Karen, thank you so much. It was a, a, a brilliant piece of work, and I know it was picked up um, before we brought it even here to committee. I know the press picked up on it as well, and just the, some of the, 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 the staggering um, findings there. So thank you for coming in and briefing us today. No, thank you. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Karen. Um, Bye. Members, there was a proposal there also. I'll bring all the members in, actually, because we're moving on to other business. So I'm bringing you all into the spotlight a minute. So, yeah, there you are. You're all coming in now. Um, Sinead had made a proposal there around the, the physical literacy and then um, looking at that with, with the Department of Education. Um, so are members' agreement that we actually make some um, inquiries around that? Uh, start that off as well, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah. I think I think you're absolutely right, Sinead. I think if, if um, especially our young women um, at an early age, if they are involved in sport and uh, and a premium is put upon it, just about even the health side of it alone, uh, and, and just how that, that just promotes a healthy lifestyle, um, I think that can make a, a could make a big difference later on in life. Um, yeah, it's just. So I think it's just I know you know like if there's anything going on in school, um, if there's pressures in any any part of the curriculum, PE is always the first to go. You know it's seen as um, dispend, you know dispendable. You can just oh, we'll, we'll not bother with that this week, um, and then that leads into you know the the information in the report there about the recommended um, amount of hours um, every week um, for for you know for for sport and for for uh, physical activity so yes I, I do think we need just to find out if education are putting any um, particular focus on it we can mention the fact that it came up in our briefing and that we're concerned about it and we want to know what what sort of plans are in place to really cement PE as a core component of the curriculum 
Yeah, I think that, you know, that I, I'm happy, I'm more than happy with that. Another issue then is around the health side of it and that whole the, the uh, childhood obesity and uh, and things like that. I remember getting, a, a, a when I was the health spokesperson for the party several years ago, a, a briefing um, that my own local council had, um, or a, a paper my own local council had put together around childhood obesity um, and, and, and lack of activity. Um, that might be something as well that we maybe want to contact the health department about just to see if they have any data um, that we could pull into this as well. Um, give, I mean, if we were at the very start here of a five-year um, mandate, we'd be looking to do a committee inquiry into this, you know, to try and tie all this together. But I think we can certainly start um, this off with some preliminary a data gathering. Um, that, that would be good. Sorry, Janice wants to come in. Chair, just that maybe in the first instance, if we could write to the relevant committees to see if they have done any work on yeah. these issues. Um, I think we're sort of encouraged to do that in the first instance. Okay, yes, that's I'm happy enough with that. Uh, and then if they haven't, we can then pursue through the relevant department. Yep, I'm happy to do that, that we write to those then, those relevant committees first and foremost, to ask just, because they may well have. Um, I, I mean, I know myself, I only sit on one committee, so I don't know what other committees are doing or what they have done. Um, so, or what they have done even over the last maybe even mm -hmm. uh, four or five years. Um, so we can ask those questions first and foremost if members are happy with that. And Andy, did you want to come in there on something? No, nope, that's okay. Um, so will we start off with that first and foremost and uh, then we'll follow that up then with um, then letters to the, the, the relevant departments then after that. Members happy enough with those sure, proposals? Sure. There is a clear, Go ahead. Clear. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I, 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 oh. Karen, we can hear you. There we are. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Robin. Go ahead. Sorry, Jar. Excellent piece of research by the uh, by Reyes. Um Perhaps uh, in terms of um, sport means all forms of physical activity, but the definition is a bit ambiguous and open to uh, interpretation. Um, all sports involve physical activity, but not all kinds of physical activity involve sport. I'm thinking uh, a school quite close to my own office which is highly competitive in dance uh, and competes internationally in dance competitions. Um, I'm just wondering whether there's maybe a need to widen out the, the look at, um, uh, to be more inclusive in all forms of physical activity, not just those that are defined as, as sport. Yeah, no, I understand that as well. And I know certainly um, during lockdown, we were getting many letters from those that run Irish dance classes or dan regular dance classes in our areas and about um, how much that, that was of value to physical and mental health of our young people, especially our young girls. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's, that's a good point um, also to make. Now, any other comments on this? I, um, sorry, Chair, and, and, and apologies that I must... It's a fair bit of other adding up out there in other meeting okay. uh, that, that they couldn't really get out of. But it, it's in terms of, of the obesity piece, and I know you've proposed there, or someone has proposed, Chair, that we write the uh, other departments and see what data they have. My experience is that the data on this is very, very poor uh, that the, the, the health have. But a, a line of attack, I feel like, or, or you know, we're good at. We're, often accused of pointing out what's wrong with things or, or what people aren't doing. But, but, but a positive suggestion, I, I believe, could be that we could make, after we get hear back from the other departments, is when it comes to funding for sport and, and PE stuff around, around schools or the extracurricular, the, the money generated through the soft drinks levy or, or sugar tax, uh, in, in other jurisdictions, it's ring fence. You like uh, to tackle the problems associated with consumption of sugar, the, like, like obesity, uh, type two diabetes, and, 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 and even oral health. But the burnout consequential that comes over to Northern Ireland, and I remember in the, in the first year, I think it was 
12 million of the sugar tax the second year it was 14 million I'm not sure w- where it's at now because again it's impossible to get mom- uh, uh, answers from the finance minister or the health minister on this but that money isn't hypothecated when it comes across and it's just scattered across all departments rather than ploughed and the, the tackling o- 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 obesity uh, you know, and that could be through through funding more sports and activity programs and stuff like that. I, I, I just think it's a no-brainer. But even in the absence of ministers, officials had agreed. I've got officials ac- across communities, education and health. They, they had agreed that this is the way they should proceed, but couldn't do so because there was no executive. This is it requires an executive decision. As all that will be an easy one for the executive to agree on, but but it has never been done since. Yeah, and I suppose Mark, it flies a wee bit in the face whenever we have discussed levies um, with our our licensing bill, which I, which I know we didn't yeah. press on. Um, that would have been would have been looking at prevention and would have been looking at at helping those people. Um, with with addictions and stuff like that, it's the same with the gambling levy, and yet we have a sugar tax, which again is a levy of sorts um, that does not seem to um, wholly uh, go towards um, something that it should be going towards. So yeah, I, I get where you're coming from on that also. Um, so that we maybe just. Well, it's just uh, if people come back to other departments in the future for the department. Well, that's a great idea. How will you pay for it? Yeah. Well, yeah. We've already made answer there. Yeah. No, look, that's fair enough. I think I, I want to do our first quarter call first because we're encouraged to do it, is to go to our committees first, our, our fellow committees, and ask them have they done any piece, uh, you know, have any has any work been done on this at a committee level? Then um, following on whatever we the responses we get there, then we'll go to the departments. And I know you'd mentioned there again about that uh, the childhood obesity stuff. I am almost certain um, that it was Andrew and Newton Abbey Borough Council that I received that paper from. It wasn't the Department for Health um, to do with our, uh, my own uh, that that uh, borough. Um, uh, just what their their findings were. So we we know our data collection. Certainly, and I've, I know I bang on about it every week. Isn't is not brilliant um, here at, 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 at assembly level? So we might have to go further afield and go to our local councils um, and ask them. Um, I don't know whether that was done through part of their, uh, their their community planning or whatever, but there there might be information at local council level that can help us as well. So there there's lots of options there. Um, but members, I think we'll start off with our with our committees first if they're in agreement with that. Is that okay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All all agree. Can we move on? Yeah. All right then. Can then I'm going to ask you then to turn to agenda item nine, where we have SR twenty twenty one forward slash one one eight, the housing benefit and universal credit care leavers and homeless amendment regulations twenty twenty one. You'll find a copy of the rule at page 188 of your meeting packs. Uh, we considered the SL1 at our meeting on the 13th of May. The examiner of statutory rules has confirmed that it will be covered in her next issued report and will not be drawn to the special attention of the Assembly. So our members are sorry, have any members any objections to the rule? No, no. objections? No. Thank you. Then I'll put the following that the Committee for Communities has considered. SR 2021 forward slash 118 the housing benefit and universal credit per leavers and homeless amendment regulations 2021 and has no objection to the rule um, just before I move on to, on to item number 10 um, I've been made aware that the examiner of statute rules has noted that some delegated powers in the tabled amendment on the licensing bill um, sure. Do you hear me, folks? Because it's very yeah. wacky. Okay. Yeah. I can't hear anything. Right. What are, if members could put themselves on silent? There we are. There we go. Did um, I take it you, you got the SR okay? Everybody just nod your head. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. It's just uh, before I move on, um, the examiner of statutory rules has noted some delegated powers in the tabled amendments to the licensing bill. Um, it's just to ask, uh, do the committee wish um, to be advised on these at our next meeting from the examiner? Yes, we can ask her to come along. That'll be in closed session, of course, as well. Um, happy enough with that, yeah? Okay, all right. 
Then I'm going to move us on to agenda item 10, which is correspondence. You'll find the correspondence memo at page 199. Uh, or sorry, yeah, yeah, you will. 199. You'll see a letter there from Belfast City Council in relation to social value in um, council procurement contracts. Can I ask members, are they content to write to the minister in support of the council? Great. Yeah. Yes. If you, yep. That sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. Then I'll ask you to draw your attention to page two one nine, which is a memo from the finance committee seeking views on the establishment of an independent fiscal council for Northern Ireland. Can I then ask members uh, if they have any specific views, or are they content to write to the committee uh, finance committee to advise that the committee welcomes its, its establishment? Yeah. Chair, can we actually bring this back next week? Because it's more than that. They're asking for the powers that the Fiscal Council would have. It's just, I think, we'll need to be a bit of time just to review what they're looking at. Yeah, I'm happy enough with that. We can bring that back next week. Um, members, yeah. I don't have anything else that I want to bring up. Can I ask, is anybody else anything under the correspondence memo? No, we're OK. All right, then I'm going to move on to agenda item 11, which is our forward work program. Members, next week's meeting, we will have a departmental briefing on the video replay service, which is great, and also a briefing by Reyes on the High Street Task Force. Um, and we'll also have the June monitoring briefing. Um, so, it's been moved oh, that's the week after, is it? Yeah, it's been moved. Sorry, it's been moved to the 10th of June. Sorry, I, I need to read to the end of my line here, and that's stuff. So it's been moved to the 10th of June. Um, our members um, agreed with that. Yeah? Okay. I'm going to then move to agenda item 12, which is any other business. Members have any other business you want to raise, Andy? Did you have? Yeah, sure. Um, just a very quick one. Um, for some time now, I've been corresponding with the Minister of Finance and the Minister for Communities, and I know it's something that we as a committee have discussed uh, on numerous occasions regarding uh, changing places. Yeah. Uh, and, and the minister's come back to me, and I've been conversing with them specifically regarding the technical amendments to the building regulations and a dedicated changing places toilet fund. The minister's come back advising that he's previously indicated that uh, it would be for a department with expertise and experience in grant making uh, for the delivery of such facilities uh, to bring forward a proposal, and he'd be prepared to consider this as a priority. So I was just wondering if members would be in agreement that we write to the Minister for Communities to encourage such a proposal to be brought forward to the Minister for Finance. 100% Andy, yes, more than happy to do Brilliant. that. Members yeah. agreed, yes. Yeah. Very much so. Good thanks. stuff, Look, thanks for bringing that to our attention Andy. Thanks. Any other business members want to highlight? No? Okay. Then I'm going to move on to agenda item 13, which is date, time and location of our next meeting. Members, our next meeting will take place next Thursday, the 3rd of June at 10 a.m. I'm going to repeat that, 10 a.m. in room 29. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh,